this slide because uh, it's a busy slide, so they they, they can uh, memorize this. So. That's right. <laughs> yes. So I think we'll start now. So good. it's a good, uh, it's a pleasure. It's a good pleasure to introduce Professor Franco Nori. Welcome him to this forum, PYQT 2021. Now, you know, the ones who are curious by now, you would have realized what kind of scientist he is. I mean, in some way, he's like a star performer and his interests are very broad and outstanding contribution in all those areas which he is interested in, starting from, you know, condensed matter systems to quantum computation to games, whatnot. I mean, you can see, you know, essentially what he says is mathematical and physical sciences are in research fields. He has truly combined you know, mathematical and physical sciences crossing the boundaries, not caring for the you know, traditional boundary. So, you know, so if you read, you look at his research works, artificial intelligence, game theory, quantum computation, essentially open for all sorts of ideas. And this I realized, you know, because my students had gone there, Sriya Banaji, for six months. So the, you know, his comments regarding thesis work, all these, you know, are so measured and so, you know, authentic. Can see a man of deep understanding and scientific values. So it's a you know pleasure to welcome him to this forum. Hope many of you would benefit you know, from this talk and also you know keep learning from his research. Professor Nori, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. So therefore, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for their very kind invitation. Uh, this is a haiku, it's a three lines a Japanese style poem. It's typically five, seven, five syllables, but there are variations. A few examples of machine learning and AI applied to solve some problems in quantum physics. This will be the, the focus of today's talk. And uh, PDF files of all of our papers are available on our website. This is another haiku. It's about five, seven, five syllable. So if you want to read more, you can type on Google publications, Rick in my last name, and immediately brings you to our publications here, which are divided in different topics, quantum information, computing, electromechanical systems, uh, AI, ultrasound coupling. And so if you click here, if you click here, you see our recent publications on machine learning, artificial neural networks. Uh, two of them were recently accepted in physical review letters, one of them in physical review research, but there are other ones published recently last year, and there are other ones in progress. So here you can click on the PDF. You can actually get the original. We have all our papers are available open access. For students, uh, actually, hold on. Uh, are you seeing the, the full screen or you're seeing the... Full screen. Oh, you're seeing the full screen. Okay, good, good. Okay. And then, uh, so if you uh, look at this, uh, there are here different topics like uh, quantum tomography. There is a whole section of quantum tomography and optics. In this box here, there are reviews. So if you magnify this red box here, you can see there are short reviews in science and nature that are very pedagogical, long review papers, reviews related to quantum information. And for students, the students have found the reviews to be useful. Some of them are highly cited. Actually, quite a few of them are at least highly cited on the web of science. So from the point of view of students and postdocs, perhaps these papers on quantum computing, qubits, and many other topics might be of interest. So I'll start with topological quantum phase transitions with unsupervised machine learning. The main work was done by Yan Min Che and Dr. Clemens Knighting, and uh, also Tao Liu contributed to this, but the main driving forces were these two here. So I'll be first starting with an introduction, overview of machine learning, then topological physics, then unsupervised learning for topological quantum phase transitions, then summary and outlook. And this is going to be, I'll, I'll try to be pedagogical on the machine learning part. So, so let's do a brief overview of 
machine learning. So when you're doing science, most people do either theoretical modeling, analytical, experimental observations, measurements, computational numerical simulations. But lately, there is more and more push to do data-driven modeling. So you need to first learn from the data and based on what you learn from the data, then do inference afterwards. Of course, these paradigms are not independent. People can do some experiments together with numerics, numerical theory, and this can be all combined, but the focus in the past uh, decade or so has been on in data-driven modeling. So this is a cartoon. In this cartoon here, you have a rules could be uh, Newton's equations. So these are the rules, the equations of motion. You put in a computer, the data are the initial conditions, let's say momentum and location, and you get the output, which is the orbit, the classical orbit of the particle. If the rules are the Maxwell equations, you get electric magnetic field. If the rules are Schrodinger equations, you get the, the wave function uh, dynamics. But in a simple cartoon, the way to go from programming to machine learning is to move the outputs here and the rules outside. So this is counterintuitive. So now the new input is composed of the data and the output produced by experiments or observations or computers, whatever. And you feed it into a computer to try to generalize, to obtain rules which are more complicated than, than the usual ones. So this is a cartoon comparing traditional programming from computer programming. The sources, I put them here on website. These are different tutorials from the web here. In the learning phase, you start with a whole bunch of data. Could be many terabytes. But then, this is too much data. So what people do is you take a subset of the data that has some features, and you call it the features vector. And you, you take this subset of the initial data, and you feed it to an algorithm. And the algorithm is trying to produce a model. Then after you have a model to make sense of these features, then you go to the inf inference stage. In the inference stage, you do some test data. You take a subset of it, which is your features, the one you want to focus or highlight. You put it into the model, and you make a prediction. This happens when we were very young. I mean, children when they go to the park, when they're very young, they see a German Shepherd and a Bulldog, and then they are told they're both dogs. The German Shepherd has a nose, the Bulldog has no nose, but in spite of the fact that they're very different, the brain gets a model of what a dog is supposed to look like, even though they look very different, and then you see a Greyhound, which is very different, and then after you get a model, if you're exposed to, let's say, a chihuahua that looks like a rat, it doesn't look like a dog, but then the child will still predict, oh, even though it looks like a rat with long legs, it's still a dog. You see San Bernardo or one of these dogs that look like a sausage with long bodies and short legs. So therefore, even though the child has never seen before a chihuahua could still use this mental model to indicate it is a dog. But when the child sees, for instance, something like this, the child doesn't know it is a mob or it's a dog. Like, like in this case, no? Because it doesn't look like a dog. It looks like a mob. Okay, in this case, you can assume it's a dog, but in some cases, it is very hard to figure out. So therefore, the same process of learning children do when they see a whole bunch of dogs and trying to figure out, okay, is this a real dog or not? It's done by machines also. So you need to have an input past data. There is some training you're learning from the data. And then when you add the new data, then you, you can use these models to generate an output. So the typical machine learning process, you define a question, you gather data. Typically, it's a ton of data you need to visualize because too much data, or you can take a subset of them. You need to train an algorithm. You need to test it, collect feedback, and realize, oops, there is a problem. You need to refine it. You go back here. You need to train it again. 
test it, collect feedback. Oh, it doesn't work, refine it. You keep doing over and over and over, four to seven. When the results are not perfect, but somewhat satisfying, people say, fine. Now we're going to use this model to make a prediction. Once the algorithm gets good at reaching the right kind of conclusion, then apply the knowledge to new sets of data. It's like when you see a sheep dog, you say, well, it doesn't look like a dog, but it might be a dog because there is a nose that looks like a dog. The rest is just uh, very hard to figure out. So the classification of machine learning at a very broad level can be classified into three types, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. So this is supervised, unsupervised, reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you have a problem like uh, a protein folding. The protein is folding inside the computer and then you stop every few steps and then you ask, is the energy being minimized or not? If the energy is minimized, then you keep going. If the energy goes up, you stop and you retrace because you need to reward the steps that bring you to a lower energy and penalize the steps that bring you to high energy. In reality, you look at the free energy F equals to U, internal energy minus Ts. T is the temperature, S is the entropy. So at room temperature, you need to consider the, the entropy, the number of configurations. So I mean, there could be many configurations involved. And you don't want to get stuck into local minimums. You need to be able to get out of the local minimum and explore other minima until you find a global minimum or something which is close to. So in this kind of problem, there is a cost function in engineering or an energy landscape. And then you can penalize some motions of the protein, some foldings. If you penalize or you reward, you're doing reinforcement learning. But we're not going to talk about this anymore. This, we're going to do either supervised or unsupervised. Actually, most of the time, unsupervised. So here, what do we have? Machine learning means uh, generative modeling, optimization, reinforcement, many things. So therefore, one aspect would be supervised, unsupervised learning that overlaps with deep learning, but partly overlaps. Machine learning is broader. It involves statistical learning, generative modeling, other things. And AI is even bigger. So therefore, we have here, essentially, AI bigger than machine learning, bigger than deep learning and neural nets. So this is, roughly speaking, how they relate to each other. Categories. Supervised learning, you're training with a human supervision to recognize digits, image classification, like, uh, like recognize dogs or cats, regression. Unsupervised, which will be the focus on the first part of the talk, there is either no human supervision or minimal. And this is used for data mining, clustering, community detection, generative modeling. In this case, you're trying to find patterns. So the patterns could be, you do not know, you know that different trees are different shapes. This looks like a triangle, this looks like a round, this has many branches, this has few branches, this is very tall, this is very short. And you classify them without being told this is a pine tree or this is an oak tree or this is, this kind of labels, oak tree, is, is not given in unsupervised learning, but still you can classify them based on their shapes or their their leaves or their branching. Reinforcement learning, you learn from agent environment interaction. There is a rewards, a penalty. In general, reinforcement learning is used for games, for decisions, robot navigation. Supervised learning can be for classification, image classification, diagnostic, regression, weather forecasting, estimating life expectancy, Unsupervised could be on the clustering part. Uh, this is done a lot by Amazon and Netflix, essentially customer segmentation. So therefore there are gazillion customers buying product A or product B. So therefore you need to be able to make recommendations, targeted marketing, so you need to do clustering. So this is big thing for many companies. 
dimensional reduction, the data out there is too big, so you need to compress it, which is the meaningful compression, what to throw away. So this is a picture of machine learning to supervise, unsupervised reinforcement. We're going to be mostly working here. A bit of clustering and uh, other things. And I will not be talking more about this nor this, mostly in this area. So we know where we are on the branch there. The data are presented in something called the feature space. So you have a gigantic space of data. You throw a whole bunch of data and you focus on the features you care, some aspects of it. Supervised learning, you train with label data to learn the classification line, the boundaries predict the classification results for new test data. So the prior knowledge are needed. Unsupervised, there is no prior labels. The algorithm identify the patterns automatically. So this is an example here. This is a cat and a dog, and you need to test, is this a cat or a dog? These are human label data, but in this case, there are no labels. You need to put some axes, could be, let's say, trees, which are very tall, very elongated. Actually, let me see if I can put here the... Uh, sorry, the pointer. Okay, here, sorry, here. So here, the trees, which are few branches, many branches, or, yeah. So you, you put them by clusters, could be in galaxies. There are so many galaxies, there are billions. So therefore, the software automatically needs to indicate, oh, these one are spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies, or some other kind of galaxies. But you do not know if it is Andromeda or if it is uh, the Milky Way or the Whirlpool Galaxy. You, you don't have any label. You simply are looking at qualities like if it is spiral-like or if it is uh, ellipticity, some property. So here you do you do some learning from the data and some label you give a probability. And then I hear also there's a given some data there's a probability for clustering, dimensional reduction, feature extraction here. And we're going to use this to classify quantum phase transitions in physics, but before I need to give an introduction of the, the big picture here. If you do supervised learning, you need to parameterize the model with some parameters. So there is an objective function or loss function or cost function or energy cost. So you need to minimize the energy or cost or loss with some constraints. This can be used for linear, nonlinear regression, for support vector machine, artificial neural networks, kernel methods, is to classify the different objects or to do fitting. This is a typical one. So there is here image of a cat or a dog and then the machine gets the input and the, these are the input neurons. They are the hidden neurons. This one layer could be two, could be three, could be four, typically one, two, three, four. And there's some output. And at the end, it concludes there's a dog. And this is from Carnegie Mellon, but uh, this, there, there are lots of machine learning algorithms which are essentially focused on dogs. For some reason, dogs and cats are very popular in this community. Indeed, here there is uh, uh, something called, uh, uh, let me see here. Is this, do you see the the front here? Uh, let me just move it here. Okay, now it's better, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because before you saw the, uh, you saw the, the panel, no? Correct? Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry about this. It, uh, you, you should have told me because I could have moved this. So. What is machine learning? This is a two-minute summary I took from these authors on the web. And then the example is one of the pictures is a group of labradoodles. These are some dogs. The other one is a bunch of fried chicken, which is which? Most people can find the difference, but for a long time, it was almost impossible for computers because they essentially, as you can see here, you cannot see any eyes, any nose. There is barely a nose there, but essentially they look very similar. And uh, in the community for a while, there were several Twitters or messages there devoted to the issue of artificial intelligence, intelligence struggles to tell the difference between fried chicken and labradoodles. 
because you can see here they look very similar here. And then the comments on the web were like, uh, yes, they are different. It's difficult to tell the difference, especially if you put labradoodles in a bucket, like uh, chicken, fried chicken in a bucket. And then the comments, in my experience, the chicken is a bit crunchier. The meat is less rich. Some people say it tastes the same. And then there were very interesting comments. But then there was this one here, tip to AI. It is in the eyes. But this is misleading because if you look at this, you can see two eyes and a nose, and you could think that, oh, it's a chihuahua, but these two eyes and the nose is a chocolate chip muffin. So it's not a dog. And these two eyes on the nose is a muffin. And if you put the, the eyes on the nose properly, it will look even, uh, even closer. Or you could add eyes to the chicken and then become more difficult for the program to figure out which one is which. Like, like this and this, for instance. Like in this case, you cannot see any eyes almost. So therefore, they all look like uh, fried chicken. This case, Pomeranian or Pancake. So if you put the, the, the chocolate chips, should have been put actually in the same order, one, two, three, it will look uh, similar. Or this is something called Corky or Love Bread. So if you look at this, is the rear of a dog. Looks like bread. This also looks like bread. At least for the computers, it's, uh, it had difficulties distinguishing between this and this. Or most people will have a difficult distinguishing between this and this. Or in this case, for instance, no, is this a towel? Are these towels here or not? So this one's have to be a dog. It doesn't look like a dog, but it's, uh, it is. And this also. So therefore, now let's go back to unsupervised learning. So therefore, we need to find clusters. And there's an algorithm called k-means algorithm. k is the number of clusters. You're clear this is important, so the object is to minimize the total distance with respect to the cluster centers. So therefore, you have essentially K means, in this case, there are three clusters. They are randomly generated with the data domain. And then in this case, you need to find the nearest ones. You paint them blue because they are they, they find they have the same proximity, they are close to each other in this axis. Like if these ones are, let's say, spiral behavior. So this will be probably spiral galaxies. And these were very elliptical. These are elliptical galaxies. This one's somewhere in the middle. So the ones between are also spiral because they're all, they have a, lot, a large spiral structure. But you need to define the boundaries. So you need to do you look at the Voronoi diagram between them, like uh, bisect, and then look at the mean, and then shift the whole thing, and redo it several times until you get the convergence. So this is called a k-means algorithm. It's a way to find the boundary between, let's say, spiral galaxies, elliptic galaxies, and the, the other ones which are not. And it's a classi classification algorithm, which is unsupervised. So therefore, you can also do it. There is a simple structure. You can do simple projections here. But in some cases, the red and the blues, they cannot be separated so easily on this principal axis. There's a nonlinear embedding. So the reds and the blues need to be embedded in a nonlinear manifold. And these are represent similarities. So these ones are close to each other. There are no labels. There are no prior label, But these are similar to each other. These are similar to each other and so on and so forth. And these are the blue ones are very different from the red ones. So you're mapping or embedding these into an effective low dimensional space, preserving their similarities. The co principal component analysis is done for simple cases. It's a linear map. It is for simple structures. For unsupervised learning, uh, you can do k-means. In general, there's no Euclidean structure, no linear method. You need to construct a graph. You need to connect the graphs together. Look at the spectral clustering or like a Laplacian eigenmap. And then for the more complex data sets, you need to look at the non Euclidean structure, nonlinear methods, and, and so on. In this case, you're looking at the shortest path between two points in the graph to approximate the geodesic distance of the manifold. And the fusion map is a variation of the spectrum embedding, but with a probability interpretation. It's a Markov chain, and is robust to noise. 
we'll show this afterwards. So therefore you can do a nonlinear embedding in a way that you get the reds close to the reds, the yellow to the red, yellows, green to the greens, blue, and this is done via the isomap. There are some books on these on pattern recognition, machine learning, element statistical learning, topological physics now. So in this case, quantum physics meets machine learning in different ways. In this case, quantum mechanics and quantum enhanced machine learning, some people are doing this. And then what we're doing is quantum, essentially machine learning, classical machine learning applied to quantum. So to identify quantum phase transitions using many body physics, this work. In the next slides, I'll be showing you about quantum state tomography. And then afterwards, I'll be showing you how we're doing, how to do classical machine learning to assist experimental data analysis. So we have been working on one, two, and three on different papers. So I will not be talking about this. In standard phase transitions, is driven by uh, quantum fluctuations like melting, evaporation, spin fluctuations. The order parameters are local. So, and then and there is spontaneous symmetry breaking. In the topological phases beyond Landau, the paradigm, there is no local order parameter and there is no symmetry breaking. So it's more difficult to characterize these topological phases. They are characterized by global properties, topology, and is an integral of a local geometrical quantity, which is the Berry curvature. Actually, Berry is going to give a talk at the summer school, so this is appropriate. Talk about this over the first brilliant zone. So this is a coffee cup, but essentially can be mapped to a donut because there is a genus one, there is one hole there. So from the point of view of topology, the coffee mug and the donut are the same. They can be continued distorted, the topological equivalent. And the orange is topologically different because it has no holes. So how do we apply this to physics? So let's look at the block state and there is a physical and geometric perspective. So you look at the Schrodinger equation in K space, not in real space. There's a wave function, mathematician called fiber bundle. Then you see how this state changes with K in momentum space or in K space. And then you take the expectation value of this rate of change with respect to the original state, the bra. And this gives you a vector potential, which is the very connection. If you take the curl of this vector potential, you get an emergent magnetic field. And this magnetic field originates from the rate of change of the wave function along the k directions. Once you have this field, you can actually uh, use it for, for topology. But we need to remember the gauss bonnet theorem. We re it relates the integral of the Gauss curvature k of the closed surface with the Euler characteristic here. And G is the genus. For an orange is zero, for a donut is one. And if a donut with two holes is two, et cetera. So therefore we have here the Gauss curvature, the Euler character, and the genus, which is the number of holes, sphere zero towards one. And then you take this very curvature here, which is obtained from the curl of A, and when you integrate over the Brillion zone, you get this churn number or churn character, this topological number, which is, it tells you how many windings, how many wrappings of the map from the Brillion zone to the state space. So, and these tell us, this is related Essentially, it is the Chern's number is the quantized number in the whole conductance. So Thaulis will got the Nobel Prize for many works he did, but one of the papers he did is to relate the Chern numbers with this quantized conductance, E squared over two, and this is a topological origin. So this for the insulating case, for the quantum hole state, there is a quantized conductance, and it has 
a topological origin. In, the, in this state, there is a genus of this kind, in this case, like an orange. There are some pedagogical books or reviews on this, but I'll... There are other topics, interactive many body, higher order or remission. Uh, this will be discussed. We have many of these papers without machine learning on our website, so you're welcome to look into them. The goal now is how to study topological quantum field transitions with machine learning. And then let's look at unsupervised. So we're looking at topological clusters and their boundaries from a given set of Hamiltonian wave functions. And this is to make it easier to see these topological quantum phase transitions. People did before work on supervised, but you need to have prior knowledge and label data from each phase. You need to train the network. And there were essentially one paper before doing unsupervised. It was only for spin systems. They were using Euclidean distance to construct. We did a better metric. This is not optimal. So the two clusters will be here. In this case, the blue ones are the spins are polar, polarized. And as soon as you move, the spins rotate globally. Here, the rotation is local in this phase from one spin to the next one. So there's a boundary between global rotations and local rotations here. And the spins are represented by these vectors here. There is this winding number. And in reality, there is some noise in the system. And the clear distance is defined in this case as this dot product between different spins, spin L and spin L prime. There are two different spins. You look at their components. And then uh, uh, so you can get this uh, Euclidean distance between the spins. So therefore, the Euclidean distance we have found sometimes fails or is suboptimal. So we look at a more generalized. And then we did as a key steps with the following. We're, look, we're slicing the Brillion zone into different patches. Then we stack the bluff vectors or wave functions at discrete momentum points as a high dimensional feature vector. This is the input. Then we use an appropriate distance metric to evaluate the similarities and differences between this feature vector, this input. And then we construct a graph structure data set. And then we embedded the original data set into a meaningful low dimensional Euclidean space via an appropriate graph. Is there like a node embedding? And then we do some clustering algorithm in the very Euclidean space. And then we retrieve the boundaries of these identified clusters at these critical lines. And this you can find it on our website, more details. The similarity matrix or the kernel matrix is essentially this one here that tells you when the, when the points are far apart, the similarity decreases exponentially. So there is zero. So it's essentially zero or one. If you're very close to each other, it's close to zero and it's close to one. And it's far apart, this is very large and it becomes zero. The square distance between the sample vectors, this is the metric here, and this resolution parameter. So this similarity matrix becomes binary entry value because, because if it is inside the cluster, you can assume the distance is very small. So it gives you one. And the away between clusters is very large, so the matrix is just zero. But there are different matrices, could be LP, where P could be two for Euclidean or infinity for Chebyshev distance. Essentially, you take the maximum value. So this is the Euclidean distance and the Chebyshev distance. This is for P equal two, the standard distance. And this is, you're looking at the bigger coordinate. So Chebyshev distance is bigger coordinate. How to detect the phase transitions? So we did it via machine learning. With the manifold learning, you can retrieve the boundaries in momentum space and real space. And then the Chebyshev distance turned out to be sharpens the boundaries. It's easier to see the faces. The clear distance is not good. Essentially, you will see the result is 
And then uh, it's possible to learn about topological phase transitions in an unsupervised manner by using this isometric map or diffusion maps. And then because this is useful because you cannot do it directly. There's no local order parameter. We also apply to two models, the schiffer higer model, so Schiffer from SSH, and the QWZ model. These are very popular in condensed matter. And then uh, we look at the limitation demonstration for learning real space. And then uh, it's this provided a good performance. So the capability of manifold learning in exploring this phase transition. So this is the QWZ model, QWZ model after the last name. So the Hamiltonian has this zero component here. This is trivial, it's not, not so important. This D has X, Y, Z component. These are the Pauli matrices. The sigma KX, sigma KY. This is the chemical potential, which is the rate of change of the energy with respect to the number of particles. And B is the hopping integral is the kinetic energy. Is how much energy does it cost to go from A to B in the lattice, nearest neighbors? And then it's possible to compute from this vector D. You need to see how this Hamiltonian changes along Kx, along Ky, then take a curl and the dot, and this can be proven to be the Chern's number. And this is a block vector here is in terms of this, this is the normalized D. So this topological Chern's number here measures how many times the mapping wraps over the unit sphere. So therefore, at a few momentum points in the Brion zone, there are these, these uh, phase transitions because the block vector changes sign and the wave functions suddenly become orthogonal. In other cases, it becomes smooth. And then we can measure the distances either Euclidean or Chebyshev and compare. And when you do Euclidean distance, the boundaries are not well defined. When you do Chebyshev distance, you're looking at the largest coordinate, you can see very sharp boundaries between them. So therefore, these similarity matrix sample over this model can give you sharp boundaries among different phases, which can be derived actually uh, by other means to check. The nonlinear embedding is a bit tricky, involves similarity matrix. Are the points closer to each other? K is close to one. Are the points further away? K is close to zero. Then after you get this matrix, you do this operation, like some Markov chain uh, estimate, you get the transition probabilities between two nodes. Then you look at the diffusion distance defined in this manner. Then the nonlinear embedding is obtained by minimizing the cost function. So you're looking at this distance in the embedded Euclidean space. And there's a procedure that uh, is explained in our paper, but at the end, you get a phase boundary with the chemical potential here, which is the energy cost when you change the number of particles as a function of the kinetic energy has these phase boundaries and the analytical results and the one by machine learning give a perfect agreement. <laughs> this is for zero chemical potential for four times B, eight times B, where four times B is the energy band with for these lattices, because B is the, the hopping integral. <clears throat> you can look at the low dimensional embedding images in Latin space, <clears throat> and you can see there are well spaced projections that indicate excellent clustering. So you can see that uh, for negative chemical potential is separated, large one is separated. This is very good clustering, very well separated. Otherwise, if you do, if you do the simple principal component analysis, then uh, it just fails. You don't get the right result. You get, uh, actually you get one right result here for some reason, but this one here is bad. I mean, it goes overshooting, this undershooting. And you can see in the embedding, the cluster is not very good. It's a poor clustering. And there are other examples where the clustering was not non-ideal. In this model, 
a the SSH model that is this Hamiltonian here and this winding number here. here. You can see when you take the Euclidean distance versus the Chebyshev, you get here a sharper phase boundary. So the similarity matrix here is more well-defined. And you can obtain a perfect agreement with known results for different phases for this model. And the clustering is very good results. Essentially, they're very well separated. Low dimensional embedding images, well separated projection. This is hundreds of block vectors projected on each topological phase. It is more technical here. You can see the phase boundaries of this SSH model in real space. This is for the T1 and T2. These are parameters of the Hamiltonian. And if you look at the L1 norm distance, it also it, it works fine, actually. For It works even better than uh, P equal 2, which is the, the standard Euclidean one. So these are sharp defined boundaries here. Summary of outlook here, then we have unsupervised learning is suitable for problem with without level data, with no pre uh, previous knowledge. Nonlinear embeddings are better than the linear ones for retrieving topological phase transition. They, they are tricky, they're more complicated, but it's, uh, it's more powerful. Chebyshev distance for momentum data and the dual L1 normal distance for real space data are better in performance than, uh, than this commonly used Euclidean distance. And this manifold learning on nonlinear dimensionality reduction combined with this matrix can distinguish topological quantum phase transitions. So therefore, there is related work by other groups here. Uh, was published also last year. And then some examples of this in uh, optics and condensed matter and uh, topological insulators and so on. An example of neural networks that can help to solve computationally difficult problems in quantum information will be um, quantum state tomography. It's very important to assess the quality of state production experiments, but quantum tomography scales very poorly. It is impossible for systems of say 24 qubits or more. It's really bad. So therefore it's, uh, uh, let me see here if I can do the following here. And uh, Okay, this one here like this is, uh, I lost the pointer here, here. So machine learning is designed to efficiently handle big data, so can help with quantum state tomography because it involves lots of data. So this work done by mostly by uh, Abjit Melkani and Clemens Knighton. It's called eigenstate extraction with neural network tomography. So uh, we're going to use artificial neural networks because they have been shown to be successful for tomography of pure states, but we like to do for mixed states by doing a successive reconstruction of the eigenstate of the mixed state. This is already published, is an editor suggestion. And then, uh, so we look at first some of our tomography this particular kind of machine learning and neural network, and then the results here. It's challenging because you need to measure four Pauli matrices for a single qubit. So a general mixed state has a block vector that can be recovered by doing four measurements. You have n qubits, you need four to the n Pauli measurements. So this is exponential scaling, and this is very expensive for large system sizes. So therefore, the experimental data is noisy and therefore people use maximum likelihood estimates to reconstruct the, the data, but it's very expensive post-processing. Post so for, for ion trap experiments initially for eight qubits took an entire week. And there were some tricks to compress the sensing, reduce number of measurements, linear regression, but it still took a long time. And there were just too many problems. So therefore, to reconstruct an eight qubit state, you see, okay, this took a week, 
And then uh, exactly for a 14 cubic stay was estimated to take centuries. And that's longer than the time a graduate student needs to graduate. So you need to find a different method. So we did a collaboration here, how to do full reconstruction of a 14 cubic state within four hours. Was in Egyptian physics a few years ago. This is uh, far more time, this is uh, it's all data. It's a video after. The people were interested in how to do fast, uh, but this was done before machine learning. As you can see the four poly matrices here, the single qubit state is right there, this is a density matrix. You need to take this four to the n expectation value. This is too time consuming. And uh, so can machine learning help to do this? So therefore, yes, so you need to have this input goes here. So every neuron is a function that gives you this output in terms of this input. So there is input one, x1, x2, you put a, a weight, w0, w1, w2, and you can get this result. The nonlinear activation function, which is like either sharp heaviside function or the sine or linear or piecewise linear or sigmoid or hyperbolic tangent, and they all essentially give you zero one depending on the input. So it creates a linear decision boundary in input space. So this is how the neurons work. Essentially, it's a function of the output as a function of the input with some weighting factors, W1, W2, W0. And then uh, training consists of step-by-step -step adjustments. You're changing the parameters over and over to minimize the cost function because you have W0, W1, W2. So you can actually tune them. And when you train the neural network, you can actually classify on non-state faster. So you can use deep neural networks, many hidden layers, or these convolutional ones implementing exploited translational invariants or some other ones. So you have an input layer, hidden layer, output layer, they're all connected to each other. So it could be either shallow or deep. And there's some training data, you're trying to minimize a cost function with gradient descent. And then if you wanna do deep convolutional recurrent, you can add more layers, hidden layer one, two, three, but there's always an input layer that gets the data, an output layer where the data comes out. There is one called restricted Boltzmann machines, which is physically inspired because two layers or nodes are visible, are, are, are connected to each other via weighted links, but the link has a Boltzmann distribution. So it's an energy function. Restricted means there is no intralayer coupling, so it's easier to, to train. This has been used, these restricted Boltzmann machines to approximate probability distributions where the marginal distribution of the visible nodes is the target distribution to be trained. They are very powerful, they're very successful because the probability distribution can be sampled by Gibbs sampling without having to determine the partition function. So it can be analyzed analytically for some simple cases. For the complicated ones, you cannot do this impossible. These are examples of something called generative models. Generative models are called generative because they generate, produce samples from a probability distribution. So that's why I call generative models. They generate samples from a probability distribution. So there's an energy function here. So energy function is, uh, there is the spins are interacting with a magnetic field and there is a weighting factor here and then there is a magnetic field and then the spin interaction. So there is some energy function, Boltzmann distribution here, P. So the Boltzmann distribution is weighted by the exponential of the energy. And there's a minus sign here, here. And then you get a target distribution once you sum over the values of magnetic field as a function of the configuration. So every spin configuration has a probability. And there is an efficient evaluation by Gibbs sampling and Z is not needed, there's no need to do a partition function. So this is a generative model. It's called restricted because there is no link in the visible layer between blue and blue and there are no links between red and red in the hidden layer, but there are lots of links 
between the blues and the reds. So the input visible and the output hidden, they're connected to each other by these W factors that will be trained. Essentially, they, they will be iterated because you need to train these weighting factors to be able to optimize something. In this case, either lowering the energy, but you do it with a Boltzmann distribution. So you're trying to imprint this Boltzmann distribution on your configuration space. And you do that by changing these Ws. There are lots of Ws. So you can, it's like you can do overfitting here. So there is a wave function here. And then uh, there's a probability with resistive the Boltzmann machine. Uh, there is a phase is uh, for either resistive Boltzmann machine or fit forward near network. They approximate complex, highly entangled states. The ground state of H in the transverse could be for many number of spins, 20, 40, 60, 80 spins. And then uh, in this paper, they did reinforcement learning through minimization of this, uh, this is a cost function. This Carle and Troyer did a, a great, a very interesting work on how to do this pure state quantum approximation uh, in this work here, focusing on re using reinforcement learning by minimizing the cost function. So the pure state neural network tomography was done afterwards by uh, Torlai et al, in nature physics, where they were looking at the independent nested measurements of the training data. And there is something called the cool black library diversion, some sort of cost function. It's like some sort of penalty function. And then this, if you do it iteratively properly, you can substantially reduce the number of measurements and you can obtain W states up to 20 qubits successfully with high fidelity. So therefore, given this success on pure state, can we go beyond that to mixed state tomography? So therefore, we need to retrieve the dominant eigenstate. So this is the low rank mixed state, this density matrix here, these are the probabilities. The dominant eigenstate is the closest pure state. So you start here moving among the pure states and you're trying to get as close as possible to the target state here first. And you do it in an iterative manner and then is robust on the variation of the distance measure, and this is measuring the maximum fidelity. And these distance measure are estimated from the measurements here. So the step one is pure state tomography, retrieving the state here from the measurement, calculate the measurement statistics for this wave function, and then from this determine the dominant eigenvalue and construct the new density matrix, calculate the measure. You do this over and over in an iterative manner, and then you terminate at some desired rank when the system is essentially converged. If you look at this using data for trapped ions, let's say from R to AQ, you can actually approximate the W states fairly well. And then the fidelity, it goes up to three nines, uh, two to three nines. So therefore, the eigenstate, the dominant eigenstate reliability is recovered, at least partly. The, the, this is for the wave function for the eigenfunctions, also for the, uh, the eigenstates also. So this is for the iterative eigenstate extraction. There are benefits and challenges. It's most relevant information on quality of state production, directly retrieve. There's beneficial cost scaling, flexible rank, and the conclusions of the first part, because essentially is one hour, I mean, I started later, so I could continue a bit later also, is that it is possible to extract the eigenstates using neural network tomography. It is cost efficient and scalable and delivers the most relevant information about the state generation and it's an interesting and viable use case for machine learning because if you don't use machine learning or some of the tricks, you try to do anything else for many qubits, it just takes forever. And you cannot do quantum computing or quantum information processing without doing tomography many times. You need to find out what the state is. And then I'm going to be talking in the second part in the afterwards, 
I'll be talking about quantum state tomography with conditional generative adversarial networks, which are more sophisticated neural networks. This is done mostly done by Shanawas Habmed, who he went from Bits Pilani to my group some years ago and then finished the master in my group. And then uh, he was a postdoc in my group, postdoc in my group, but they both moved to uh, Sweden Chalmers as a faculty and as a graduate PhD student. And Munoz went to Oxford and then right now he's a faculty in Madrid. And we recently completed some work on quantum state tomography with these conditional generative adversarial networks. You can find the papers on our website, it's in the archive also. And I'll be talking about these in the next part of the talk, but as, as a brief overview in case some people need to leave, we're also studying tomography, but using a different technique is adversarial networks. So there are two neural networks who are essentially dueling with each other. One of them is called the generator and the discriminator. So the generator generates and the discriminator says, I don't believe you, or that's not a good generation, do me another one. And the generator keeps generating and the discriminator keeps eliminating until finally the discriminator is satisfied to learn about multimodal models of the data, essentially to do optical state tomography for lots of data. And the data is often noisy for superconducting circuits. And this can be improved with custom neural network layers that enable the conversion of the output from any standard neural network into physical density matrix. So this allows to reconstruct the density matrix and then the generator and the discriminator network, they are trained each other on data using standard gradient based methods. And we demonstrate that the technique can reconstruct optical quantum state with very high fidelity, which are orders of magnitude faster and from less data than a standard maximum likelihood method. Somebody's here, you can. So we also show that the quantum state tomography can reconstruct a quantum state in a single evaluation of the generator network if it has been pre-trained on a similar quantum state. So I'll be showing this afterwards, but before doing that, because this is the end of the first part of the talk, let me advertise something that will be useful for all of us. If you're a student, if you're a postdoc, if you're a faculty, you need to calculate things. And there is a software developed in our group called Qtip. The software has been downloaded zillions of times. And this allows students to immediately calculate results in cavity QED. So you have a qubit or a three-level system or four-level system inside a cavity. There is light bouncing back and forth here. Is a ground state state. And you can actually describe this system very well using this, this, this called quantum toolbox in Python. It actually is written right here, very small. But also if you're studying optomechanics, so the light is bouncing back and forth. So there is A, A dagger, omega of the cavity, but this mirror can actually oscillate. So there is this B operator, there is quantized, motion of the mirror, you can do quantum optics, you can do this block wave representation, you can do quantum circuits, you can do waveguide QED, you can do optimal quantum control, stochastic dynamics, spin lattice dynamics, and you only need to look at qtip.org, and this, this is used by Every company you can think of, IBM, Google, Rigetti, everyone is using this all the time. Every single of the top groups in the world, they're all using it because it allows to compute dynamics of the system in very different uh, situations in a very easy 
manner. And uh, if you want, one member of my group will give you a talk on this uh, in the future. I could talk to you after you're interested. In cavity QD, you have an atom in a cavity, but you can replace this by a, a superconducting resonator. So the atom is replaced by a flux qubit and the mirrors by a transmission line resonator. Essentially, it's a coaxial cable, which is sliced. And this has vacuum oscillations. And this can be due to, to do stronger coupling, arbitrary interaction time, scalability. So this is useful. This is the, what IBM, Google, Rigetti, D-Wave, they're all using this kind of qubits here. And this is an example. You had the qubit in a cavity. So the cavity photon is going back and forth, but there are some losses, K rate. And when it goes up and down, you absorb the photon, decay and emit photons. Some in the cavity, some of them are leaking out. Or you can have many atoms and you can enhance the coupling. This can be studied using Q-tip. There are recent additions about photon scattering waveguides, efficient model dissipation, non-Markovian. The non-Markovian one was done by Shanawas Ahmed, who's in the audience. He's from Bispilani and Neil Lambert, who's here in Riken. So they are the black belts on how to study environment with memory or without memory and in a proper manner. But with, with, with memory, is more complicated. It is a long paper here in Nature Communications. This was developed by uh, Nathan Shamath and uh, Shanawas Ahmed. It is a paper which is highly cited on efficient model local dissipation. And this is done by Ben Bartlett and company. And uh, they are different. So if you see here, when you do dynamics, typically you do Hamiltonian dynamics. But then you need to add additional terms if you take into account the environment. But if you do that, then when the qubit numbers increase, the space dimension goes up. So in this case, you get uh, numerically unfeasible, 2 to the n, but in this case, it goes 4 to the n, becomes like a killer. So if you want to do Liouville and space dynamics, you need to find efficient methods to deal with that. And Q-tip has this kind of Liouvillean dynamics interacting with the environment done by essentially uh, Shanawath, Neil, and Nathan, and collaborators there. So therefore, I can stop here for the first part of the talk. And then if you have questions, you can do it. Or I could go to the second part, which is the one on a, a, this... Uh, Dueling networks. Should I continue briefly or what, what should I? We'll just wait. Let us see if some questions are there. Okay. Do you have any quick questions on this part before we go into the, the second part, which is essentially the same thing, neural network, but will be more complicated system? Uh, there are a few questions in the chat box. May I read them for you? Okay. Let me just click on the on the on the chat, is, are they, are this on the chat? I hear this chat here. How do we avoid partition function calculations in resistive Boltzmann machines? The, the, you do not need to do it because you are essentially, you have a configuration of spins. Actually, this is easier to look at the actual slides here. You know the spins, and there is some magnetic field. So therefore, you compute this energy here, and then there is a probability of this configuration to exist. And then the target distribution is this, and this can be this can provide, the evaluation can be done by Gibbs sampling without computing Z, it's just not, not needed. You just, if you look at the, at the algebra, you just simply, there is no need to do it. If you do the traditional approach to statistical mechanics, 
you need it, but this is not the standard theory. You get a partition function and you take the first derivative for the energy, second derivative for the, for the specific heat, or the first derivative with respect to the field for the magnetization and the second derivative for the susceptibility. If it is derivative with respect to the temperature, it will be specific heat and, uh, sorry, energy and specific heat. That procedure is not needed here. So it's, uh, let me see which other question I have here. Let me see if I can find here. What are the input and output for the, uh, the total constant? If the rules, if I understand correctly, are. Okay, in this case, what you're doing is the following. You're fed some data, and then you do the k-means clustering. So therefore, you see that there are this phase here, this phase here, the, the clustering. And afterwards, you do the, you can do the Euclidean distance, you can do the Chebyshev distance, and then see which one gives you a better separation, better boundary between the phases. We tried all of them, we got some of them were getting lousy results, some of them kind of okay, and some of the ones very good. So therefore, and the, there was another question here for, uh, and then uh, the other question was, good morning, sir. Thank you, sir. It's very polite. This audience is very polite, very good. And then, uh, is it possible to connect different machine learning systems in network to get better outcomes? Let me think about this. Is it possible to connect? Ah, I see. So therefore, like to mix them up, hmm, like hybrids. Some people do that, but it's uh, we have not done hybrids, but uh, I guess in principle you could do that. And then, uh, because the field has been growing at the rate of Hinton, the guy who is the pioneer on deep learning, he's getting like 28,000 citations last year. So I bet among these 28,000 papers or 20 some thousand papers, I'm sure some people must have done all kinds of hybrid system, but there is no way any human can monitor what's going on in this field. The field is like exploding. So the answer is yes, some people might have tried, but uh, uh, nobody can keep track of uh, here. Uh, okay, so the initial state to the prevalent quantum state tomography. I know, but the, the, the unknown quantum, okay, the question here relates to the next talk, which is, or the previous talk. You do some candidate state and you do an iterative process that brings you better and better to the target because you're measuring distance between where, where you are and where the target state is. So the initial state, is not the, is not the, is like, is like a good guess. And then from this good guess, exactly, you need to have an initial guess. And in this case, you need to find an educated guess. But the same way you do quantum, when you do variational Monte Carlo, you always need to have an educated guess. You need to know something about the physics. Typically in the ground state for variational Monte Carlo, you get a ground state that has no nodes. Or even for, for many variational states, you need to have some educated guess at the beginning based on the physics. So therefore, okay, so good. So right now, we're going to go into the, the second part of the talk, which is the adversarial ones, which is here, end slide show here. And then uh, a, the other one is here, neural network, and this one here. And then I need to stop the sharing and I'm going to share the other one, which is, uh, how do I share the other one here? Uh, screen share, uh, where it is the other one here. And then, uh,
do you see now the entire talk, the entire slide? Yeah. We yeah. Okay. But we see your uh, uh, presenter view, not the slide. Ah, so so I need to I need to swap them. Okay, okay, good. So let me just swap them again here. Okay, good. Now is better. Yeah. Okay, so then let me move things this one here. What was the characterization with Deep Neural Network? This is Shana was at Med with Anton Fris Kokum, Carlos Sanchez Munoz. These are the papers here I just talked before. And the preprints are there. And I'm going to go quickly here. So typically you have some parameters you put into the model and you make a prediction and you get some data. So you can do either forward to generate data in this forward direction, given some parameters in the model, you get it. Or you can go backwards. You get the data and the model, and you go backwards. And there is here some noise involved here because experimental data always has noise. And this is the. So you can learn from data. So you get a whole bunch of data, and you do machine learning. You can make predictions here. Or you can do quantum state characterization, where you can get the measurement first. You input the measurement in the neural network, and you get a density matrix. You can get the fidelity, entanglement, big and negativity. So we're going to be focusing on this part here, quantum state characterization. So you have some data, some measurement operators you input in the neural network, but the generator has several layers here, which is the density matrix, compute expectation values, take into account the noise, and then you get the reconstructed data from the raw data. So the raw data and the reconstructed data are both input into the neural network that has a discriminator. Discriminator is going to figure out if the reconstructed data is good or not, because there is some noise involved here. There is the first part, this is the matrix involved this decomposition, trace normalization. The expectation value is the Born rule, the projection operator. And then here you need to do some good noise models like Gaussian photon loss. So therefore, the data is processed to get this. And then this one here tells you, yes, the processing was well, it's accepted. No, it's not. Go back to it and keep doing it over and over. So this is called quantum tomography QST with condition generative adversarial networks. And then, so this is the, the uh, so supervised, unsupervised. So therefore, we talked about this in the, in the training set that you have input data X and the output data Y, and then you train the model with predictions. And then is this a dog or not? You do Y minus Y prime or Y hat, you compute the error, you update the model, change the parameters, you keep doing it over and over and over. And when the difference between the output data and the prediction is small, you stop. But you need to have input variables X and the output class Y, you need to have both. If you remove Y, then you can get only this. But in this case, you only are extracting patterns in the input data. So you can only find, are you only looking at the interesting patterns, no? Is the tree shaped like a triangle? Could be a pine tree or like a Christmas tree or a shape like a circle, a shape has many branches or so. And this, this is unsupervised learning. And this involves clustering, which we did before, and generative modeling, which we're going to do now. So examples of unsupervised learning were k-means, which we used before, and generative adversarial networks, which we're going to be talking about now. So therefore, there is no comparison here at this point. So you have a quantum state here, classification. You take a measurement here in the cavity. The qubit is measuring here. You get a signal. And then the modulation you get, is it a dog or is it a cat? Is it in the ground state, zero, or is it in the, in the excited state, one? So again, classification is you look at the data and you need to know is a dog or a cat. You see it uh, zero or one. Reconstruction is different. Reconstruction, you get a, a state, but you need to do the bond rule. You need to the operator O. You need to project it. And you will project. You get either a dog or a cat. You have the data here, and then there is the data, and then you do a reconstruction algorithm. So in this case, there's a probability to be a dog or a cat, or probability to be the ground state or the excited state. 
And then you recover the probability density that allows to sample the picture of a dog or a cat. In reality, you, you have in a complete characterization of the quantum state because you're getting the, the density matrix. You're getting the entire information. But this is reconstruction. It's like an inverse problem. So essentially, like uh, this is the inverse problem. But the inverse is very hard to do when the matrix is 2 to the n or 4 to the n is too big. You just you cannot do it directly. So you need to do something different. You need to do a uh, discriminative mo modeling. So these are generative models. You are generating a new example from an input distribution. So the input distribution could be a Gaussian. So the generative model can generate uh, this, this, uh, with this data from the Gaussian. And a good generative model can generate new examples that are not only plausible, but they are indistinguishable from the real samples. So it's like generating counterfeit bills, but they're getting better and better that you cannot distinguish the fake bills from the real bills. So in this case, the, discri the discriminati discriminative modeling predicts it's a classification. And then in this case, generative just generates an example here. So uh, deep learning models, they're all uh, generative. Could be two popular ones, restricted Boltzmann machines or other ones. For deep learning generative will be uh, GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, or GAN. These generative adversarial networks, or GANs, are deep learning-based generative models. So therefore, you have here um, uh, a, some input here, There's some noise. In fact, this is a generator model, generate new plausible examples from the problem domain. Discriminator is classifying the examples. Is it real or is it fake? And then, uh, and then the generator takes some fixed length random vector, and then you, you take it from a random, it's a, it's a Gaussian distribution to see the generative process. You, you need to train it afterwards. And this is called the latent space, vector space, but this is a technical thing. Essentially, you, you generate samples here. So the generator generates samples, and then uh, and they are provided to the discriminator. Discriminator needs to decide, are these real or fake? Is this a dog or a cat? Is this a zero or a one? Is this a... So therefore, and this is a quote from a tutorial. You can think of the generator as being like a counterfeiter trying to make fake money. And the discriminator is the police trying to find if the money is real or not. The counterfeiter must learn to make money that is better and better, finally indistinguishable for generating money. And the generator network must learn to create samples that are drawn from the same distribution of the training data. So, so they're essentially fighting with each other. So the two models are competing against each other. They're called adversarial in game theory. So they're playing a zero-sum game because either one wins or the other one wins. So the generator generates the bill, and then the discriminator compares your bill with the real bills, and they say, OK, it's a, it's a fake bill. Uh, update the model. Update the model. Update the model eventually is accepted. And then by discriminator, discriminator, sometimes there are some problems. You need to be update the model here. but most of the time is updating happening here. You sometimes you can add additional generator, additional information to the generator, or additional information to the discriminator to improve the, the quality of the of the generation and to improve the quality of the discrimination. And then uh, so now let's go back to quantum state characterization with deep neural networks, where you're going to use deep three to six layers, intermediate layer instead of one. So here it is, the input, parameters, and then you get a function, which is of the parameters here, these Ws here, and the input. So the input is fixed here, but then you can change these Ws here. So this is a nonlinear function where we learn more parameters. You can actually change the parameters. Your training means you're modifying these parameters. This W0, W1, W2, W3, W4, there are a whole bunch of Ws here. And then, because you want to approximate your output to a target. And you keep repeating. So, so therefore, your real function is a continuum, but you have this piecewise approximation. And you need to do it over and over to approximate. So therefore, 
the classification is different. You're connecting a modeling discriminator. So you're essentially, yes, some, some data. What's the probability that this data belongs to a class? Is this data belongs to the class of dogs? Is this data corresponding to a chihuahua for a dog or something like this? And then, so therefore, in this case, it's an approximation for a conditional probability. So given some data and some parameters, what's the probability you're going to get an output Y? So there is data, a neural network is going to tell you if it is a dog or a cat or a zero or a one or ground state or excited state. And then you can get this output from the data, which is here in red, and the parameter, which is here, which is black. So this is the, the class labels, Y. And this class label Y, it appears here in a probability distribution. So it's a probability that of this output. So therefore, reconstruction connects the generative modeling and then this is uh, the approximate. So there is this input here vector, and they generate samples. And there is some probability to find this, uh, this uh, data x, estimated probability densities. And then and you do that, you can actually put this additional information to get better generated samples, better classification, it is a real bill or not, is it a dog or a cat, is it a zero or a one? So there are all these discriminations happening here. And then, so the typical input is an n-dimensional noise vector. This is done for image processing. This is done for almost anything. So the, the generator has this information that has input with noise vector. They generate fake ones. And then the discriminator compare with the real ones and say, is it real or not? And you get the answer. This is the main idea. In reality, there is a feedback loop here, which is missing, which I'm going to add right now. The feedback loop is that, yes, the generator takes data and then generates this fake data. And then the training set gives you the real one. The discriminator says it's real or generated, but then Typically, it's fake, so therefore it back propagates, and then you need to change the parameters here to do better x tilde, x hat, better one. And then you do another one. So this loop happens over and over and over until finally the discriminator cannot distinguish the fake dog from the real dog or the fake cat from the real cat. This is a bit more technical. You get this Latin space where there is the, the actual the, the, the data the feature space and you have some noise generator, generate fake sample, there are the real samples here, discriminator compares them back and forth. Is this correct or not? And then fine tuning. You're fine tuning most of the time is this one here, occasionally you need to fine tune this one here. So this is how this works. In a certain way, they're fighting with each other. Say, I don't believe you, or now I believe you. So they're now in this case. Why characterizing optical on the state? Because it's very hard to do it otherwise. You need for bosonic error correction, for different kind of error correction codes. Sometimes the visual patterns in the data are very uh, insightful because you're looking at quasi probability distribution. No? So it's a picture image of the data. When you look at the Wigner function negative, you see there is this quantum component of it. At this coherent state, at these squeeze states, at this, uh, this you can get it very quickly. So therefore, in this case, the density matrix has this uh, plot. And then once you know this, <coughs> you can obtain the, the Q functions, could be the Wigner quasi probability distribution, the Husimi quasi probability distribution. You can get information which is valuable on the state, <coughs> also in a visual manner. You can see like different kind of cast states involving three of them or five, like, and this is complex information which is insightful to know how the photons inside the cavity are superimposing because you have zero photons plus a constant, one photon plus another constant, two photons plus, and how they superimpose is complicated, but then you can get this graphical insightful information about how the the quantum mechanics of these photons inside the cavity. These are microwave photons. 
So if you can have this so-called Fox state, you can look at here at the number state here. Oh, actually, hold on here. I forgot to do, sorry. You should have told me the pointer here, laser pointer, sorry. Because I could see my arrow here. The number state is well-defined here. The coherent state is this one here. The thermal state is a bit spread here in, uh, look at the real imaginary part of some parameter. The thermal state is blurred. In this case, coherent state is a bit more focused. Fox says like this. Random one is a mess. This number state we'll just I'll de describe in a moment. You can see that it's, uh, it's, it's similar to this one here, the Fox state, but they are distributed among more than just one N. Binomial is a different combination here. They have a very beautiful representation here in the Wigner distribution. The cat states are here, it's like a superposition of these two coherent states. And in between, you can see this cat state signature. And then in N state, you can see this kind of features. And these are the JKP state, which are very interesting one for, for quantum computing, quantum information are important. So these are the plots of the density matrix. And then you can immediately get an insight of what's the state inside the cavity. Is it a cat state, Schrodinger cat state? Is it binomial? It is a thermal? It is coherent? It is fog? You can do it immediately. So therefore, the, it is important to do this because this gives you this visual pattern, this Wigner function, this uh, that gives you an intuition, an insight. And to do, you need to do this very fast because tomography is damn expensive. So this is valuable. So therefore, you get some data. You can add Gaussian noise, convolution noise. Spam means uh, is not what you're thinking. It's not spam uh, mail. State preparation and measurement, which is any type of systematic noise. So probably that's why it's like spam noise, I find. Photon losses. And then you can simulate the noise during training. You can simulate thermal state, distorted binomial state. You can simulate this num numerically optimized for error correction superposition of Fox states. So these are, you're superimposing Fox states in a way that is numerically optimized to be used for error correction afterwards. So therefore, this is important to be able to, to know when you have these states. And uh, so therefore, the reconstruction is done. So you have the density matrix, you have some operators. So the operator is O, and there's a measurement here. You want to do the inverse problem. You want to find out what's the density matrix here. So you have the measurement here, generative model, and you can get this parameter as a function of the operator, bond rule, and the generative model theta. So therefore, you can get the data here, and then uh, the neural network, the density matrix here. So this is the triangular matrix, the upper triangular, the lower triangular one. And then uh, it's... Uh, so you're doing a decomposition, thermalization. You're getting first the density matrix, then Bohr rule, the ex, uh, expectation values, then you know the noise. Then, bingo, you get the reconstructed data. And then you compare the reconstructed data with the actual initial data here. And this will decide you did a good job or you did a bad job. And it's adversarial noise. And then there is here... The D is the data. So you're looking at the data initial and the data final. Is the difference very large or small? And you need to discriminate. You need to iterate this several times until you get a good. This is a movie here. So if I click here, so pay attention to this because this movie is interesting. So here, look at the iteration. The fidelity is horrible. 0 0.037. This is but for quantum computing, this is a disaster. But we haven't iterated. There's not, there's no, so now, right now let's do iteration here. Let me see how to do the, how do I get this one here? Let me see here. Perhaps I need to get the pointer out. Uh, pointer options, uh, arrow uh, automatic one, perhaps. And then uh, uh, I lost my pointer here. Uh, there is a video here. Let me see how do I do the video. Let me just get out of here. Ah, here it is. Good. Here's the video. So now we're iterating 7, 8, 14. And then the fidelity goes 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. So therefore, very quickly, by the time you get to 50 iterations, already 0.88. But you can see something that looks like a cat state already with few iterations. 
And then when you do more and more iterations, you get the fidelity higher and higher. And then in order to do quantum computing, you ideally want to have something like three nines. And this can be done quickly. This is done a bit slowly, so you can actually see how it evolves. But you can get very quickly, oh, here, like how many? Oh, see, exactly. Soon it's going to be two nines here with like 200 and some iterations. 250 or so. So this keeps running and running, and then you're going here to the level where error correction becomes gentler. You need less error correction if you have three nines. It becomes much easier. So therefore, here it is. So here it is. You get three nines with essentially 300 iteration. And you keep going up and up. And eventually, you can go four nines. And with this four nines, essentially, error correction is not needed for many operations. So, so this is great. So you can see, actually, how the iterations, you take a system which is a complete mess. The fidelity here was a mess. You iterate, and then it gets better and better. But actually, this so the blue one is no. So they were doing here the concept, the the generative adversarial network begins very bad. So the initial state is horrible, but then it gets very good compared to the other methods which are computationally expensive, and then it gets a bit lower because I mean it's not learning. It's like it's it's a bad algorithm. Whatever something happens, and then it gets better, but then it gets really good. And then it's essentially is perfect. And then he gets this very quickly, very fast. And this one here, the other maximum likelihood is very expensive computationally. This is orders of magnitude faster. It doesn't get there monotonically. It gets there one step forward, two step backwards. It's a mis there are different examples here, reconstruction where is that in some cases the traditional method fails miserably. It never again. The, the 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 neural networks they can get fast very quickly and it can get fantastic results so therefore it can tackle additive gaussian noise uh it can uh, this has been tried it can uh, it can do single shot reconstruction with pre-training so therefore you can do the data generator single shot but you need to if you pre-train it is much faster so you can go single shot reconstruction you can get very close to one further optimization gets even higher so therefore it's a experimental state so this is the the data can be very noisy and you can immediately obtain the optimized one train the from scratch parental data replacing the measurement operator and no prior training of assumption now summary these deep neural networks can be very effective for quantum state characterization. They is a, is a new technique with a GAN. It's faster reconstruction. Actually, here now I need I can go to the pointer here. No iterations. It can do mixed state with much fewer data points. It can reconstruct state from noise experimental data with arbitrary measurements. You can handle different kinds of noise. You can do convoluted, uh, Gaussian, additive Gaussian. You can put spam. You can put garbage. As long as you don't put too much garbage, you can, you can handle the data. At least the level of noise experiments have. And it can also work for single shot reconstructions. So therefore, uh, with this, I think I can uh, conclude this part. And if you have any questions, let me look at the notes here. But let me see where are the notes here. I hear this. The, the notes here are, uh, I hear this. Oh, there are 200 participants, 180 participants, good. So therefore 180 participant corresponds to a two nines fidelity or three, no, three nines fidelity will be 300. So like a good fidelity. So we look at the chat here. And then, uh, uh, okay, no questions here. How, how much time do we have? Uh, I, it's, uh, all, it's over. Oh, it's over. Okay, so if you have any questions, you can ask me now. Any student who want to ask any question, please unmute yourself and ask.
If you want to learn more about this, the short version is five pages. It's all there. Okay. It's very short. It's simple. If you want to know the gory details about how this is done, that the long version is super long. It has everything there. Shana was spent like a long time explaining every gory detail how to do it. But the short version is short, sweet, compact. It's all there. And uh, the good news is that this is a new field that combines classical machine learning, quantum information to do something useful. For. And it's not quantum computing itself. Quantum computing is done by somebody else, but you need to do the interrogation of the system. Uh, right. What density metrics do you have? Which is your state? Uh, I need to be able to read it to, to see what's happening. No? Right. And this takes a long time when you have many qubits. Yes. So. Now this optical data, is it experimental data on which? Okay, this is, okay, this is a very good. This is done on superconducting circuits because this is, this is done and published by the group in Chalmers, where Chanawas and Anton are there right now. So this is a noise experimental state, which is close to a binomial state, because they're a different kind of binomial state. The data is here on the right. And this is done on a superconducting circuit. So therefore, the qubit is used to measure what happens. So in the, in, in the cavity, you could have, let's say, one photon. It could be zero, one, two, three, but you could have a, a superposition of them. So you have the Fox state, zero, one, two, but then the question, which are the coefficients? The coefficient in front of the first photon state, two photon state, three photon state, and you can mix an arbitrary superposition of this. So you have a level of control that you cannot do in normal quantum optics. When this came out for the first time, people were just shocked. But you cannot do this in the visible regime. You can do it in the microwave regime. So the photons are wavelength or the order of centimeter or so. And uh, there you can do incredible things with this. Uh, so therefore the question here is what's the state of the photon inside the cavity and you can do gazillions of problems. And then if you prepare them properly, these states can be used for error correction, for bosonic codes. You can do for something useful for quantum information, but you need to be able to characterize them and to know exactly what there is, even though you always have data, essentially noise. The problem with quantum computing is typically is how to deal with the garbage, because this is garbage everywhere. The error correction is removing the noise. And here, it's, uh, it is robust. It is, uh, so we're very excited about I have about a question this. here, Professor Nori, I have a question here. Do you think photonic quantum computing uh, will have uh, age over other methods of quantum computing if uh, this kind of error correction is applied? Hey, would you mind repeating slowly the question? I that, am uh, asking if photonic quantum computing, photonic quantum computing, Janadu and uh, others are having a psi quantum, uh, so that will have an edge, that will have an advantage over superconducting qubits, ion trap, quantum computing, whether the photonic quantum computing will have advantage if this kind of error correction is okay. applied so, to... Okay, the, the, the question about which platform is better yeah. is still an open question. That's why there are companies doing photonic, companies doing uh, semiconductor, uh, companies doing superconducting, the ion traps also. So right now it's not clear, it's too early which one will be better. And uh, so yeah, and uh, so people are betting, uh, they're essentially, the photonic one, there are not so many companies actually doing it. On the superconducting one, most of the efforts are on the superconducting one, which are really photonic, but essentially it's microwaves, which is uh, as opposed to photons visible. And to compare them is too early right now. They have, it's a bit like apples and oranges. They have pluses or minus. The superconducting one, you need low temperature. In the ion traps, you need high vacuum. In one case, you can isolate the system better. So there are so many pluses or minuses that it's very difficult to compare them now. And only time will tell in the next decade or two. And it might be possible, but for some applications, Ion traps might be better, and for other applications, superconducting, and for other ones, photonic, but in some other ones, will be hybrid. 
because the MV centers can actually talk to superconducting qubits. So you can use the MV centers as a memory. And the photonic part is very good to connect them. So ideally, you want to get the best from all of these and combine them. The easier one would be MV centers for memory, photonic for interconnectivity, and superconductivity for processing information. And this is something that people have been thinking for. We have a review on modern physics on quantum hybrid systems, a bit old, but the basics are there. Well, we're trying to merge together. So it's not either apples. Can we get the apples and the oranges together? Can, can we actually have them to work talking to each other? And that's in this review. And uh, but that will be afterwards. So it's a good question, but these uh, people are pursuing. There are actually there are hundreds of million dollars being spent on each one of these platforms. So each, they are all interesting scientifically. They are all interested technologically. They all should be pursued. They are like beautiful systems, all of them, but they all have pluses or minuses. Well, and there are even more questions. Yes. Thank you, Professor Nori, for a very, very enlightening talk. Very, very enlightening talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And you know, our students have enjoyed it. And hopefully more people will visit the YouTube channel. Thank you so much. OK, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the questions. And it has been a pleasure. OK, Thank great. You. Thanks. And then... Oh, I need to stop the sharing yes, here. OK. Yes. So, OK, now, OK. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Joey, are you around? Yeah, he's there. Yeah. Joey, you can share your screen. And you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking, sorry, yeah. Am I audible now? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Okay, if I switch off the video because this camera. But it's webcam. not very clear. Uh, your voice is not very clear. You have to speak uh, closer to the mic or something. Yeah. Am I audible now? Uh, audible, but not very clear. That's what I'm saying. Okay. okay. Maybe Let for others might be clear, but. Uh, I can hear all of you very clearly. In fact, the last talk also I heard quite clearly. So, uh, is it uh, is it audible now? Now it's better. Now it's yeah, better. better. Okay. Yeah. Now it's better. Hello and uh, good morning, to everyone, and uh, thanks a lot for this uh, opportunity. Okay, Joy, let me introduce you. Okay. <laughs> before you start. Okay. You just share your screen. I will introduce you, then you can start. Okay. And one request, may I switch off this video because um, uh, today there is a problem. I'm holding the webcam. So if you all excuse me, I would like to switch off my own video and share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Yeah, you can share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, that's nice. Okay. Uh, let me so, full screen. Um, yeah, you can do full screen, yeah. Okay, good. Good? Yeah. So, uh, have, very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Joey Ghos, uh, uh, who is uh, assistant professor in IIT. Okay, IIT Delhi. So she did her PhD from JNU near to IIT, uh, very near, uh, hardly 500 meters away from IIT. This JNU campus is there. And now she is assistant professor in IIT Delhi. So anyway, uh, after completing her PhD in 2009 from JNU with uh, Professor Rup Manjari Kosh, uh, she went for postdoc to ICFO, Spain and spent around two years there, and then uh, got Humboldt Fellowship, and uh, went to Saarland University, um, Germany, of course, Humboldt Fellowship, and spent two years again, 10 to 12, 
uh, there and then she joined uh, joint quantum institute at uh, maryland uh, nst usa and after spending some time uh, she came as assistant professor uh, to it delhi 2013 so uh, her interest is uh, in quantum and nonlinear optics okay that's uh, broadly atomic molecular and optical physics uh, it covers quantum and nonlinear optics wide overlapping area and certainly uh, with application to quantum information technology so with these words uh, i invite uh, joy to give her talk on quantum technology in singapore thank you so much uh, professor ravi uh, and uh, so yeah that was a kind of the introduction you know, got all the details uh, correct i was just uh, hearing them thanks a lot uh, and welcome to audience so uh, yeah so actually uh, during my tenure as a postdoc we did some fantastic uh, experiments and also partly during the phd because i worked in a slightly not with single photons so today's talk is about quantum technologies with single photons Uh, but during my PhD, actually, I was mainly working on uh, EIT, uh, atomic vapor cell at room temperature. So that was also one of the interests. So maybe I go to the next slide, which talks about the interest. So we uh, have a quantum photonics group in the Department of Physics in IIT Delhi, and uh, the research interest of the group is uh, something uh, what uh, Professor uh, just said in his uh, introduction. Uh, it's quantum and nonlinear photonics. We have uh, specific interest with single and entangled photons, generating, uh, detecting them, and doing interesting physics with them, like many other groups in India and abroad. Uh, so, uh, in the past, actually, we've also worked. Uh, I had the opportunity of working with uh, single trapped atom. The earlier speaker was also uh, mentioning about this. We all know about trapped atom. So uh, we uh, did a fantastic experiment uh, with that. A couple of quite a few many experiments, of course, and a couple of very nice publications that I'm proud about. And during my postdoc, uh, regarding them, and it's also towards a quantum network scenario between photons and atoms, single photons and single atoms. Right. So if there is time, we we'll talk about the experiment. Otherwise, we'll see how it goes. So uh, now the techniques involved for all of this is, of course, as we know, particularly for single and tiny photons, is spontaneous parametric ground conversion, which which has its heart and core at uh, nonlinear physics, right? It is the center of that. So it's a chi two process, right? And one can expect to, you know, these photons that are generated, one can expect them to map them onto a polarization entangled chain. Sometimes the configuration is such. That they come out as uh, entangled photons. Of course, you have to depend on the detection. What you want to detect, not uh, if you place your detectors everywhere, you will not get it. But at certain cross positions, you get those entangled photons. But uh, sometimes, you know, this is just they come out in a mixed state, and then with the help of your optics and experimental technique, you have to map them onto a or in, into an entangled state. So polarization entanglement is a very popular thing that you can derive. Out of this uh, SPDC thing. Now, just like SPDC, there is another nonlinear optical technique, as many of us know, which is four wave mixing. Rather, spontaneous four wave mixing, we are talking about, and we are interested in the single photon regime. That's a type three nonlinear process. And again, you can have these photons and get them mapped onto uh, an entangled state, which is you know, a bell state, you know, a simple uh, state of that, right? So uh, those are the interests, and you know, encircling all of these uh, ideas. Actually, we have our main uh, work, which is running in the group right now. But uh, there's also another uh, little option because uh, we are also interested in coherent manipulation and quantum storage of light in three-level atomic media. There are many groups in there are quite a few groups in India as well as abroad who work on this. So this involves uh, electromagnetic induced transparency or you know coherent propagation trapping. So these are the techniques that are involved, and that leads to slow light, and you can also stop and store that. Okay. So this was quite exciting when uh, before and when I was doing my PhD. So uh, that's also something that uh, now I've carried it forward to my current group. So. So uh, the outline of the talk is as follows. That was a small introduction. Uh, so the outline is, uh, of course, because I was uh, told to keep it slightly pedagogical. So I'm, that's the first point. We do a small introduction to quantum information and single photon and uh, quantum system. Uh, 
rather going not going into a lot of details because I'm sure uh, it has been already introduced quite well in the summer school. Then we will go about speaking, uh, you know, on the techniques of producing, which I already talked about briefly, but we will elaborate and, you know, the kind of studies that we are doing in our group. And um, then actually we will, uh, so this is a slightly, uh, the last two points are slightly, uh, so I'm going to first speak about the upcoming endeavors, which are uh, currently our uh, you know, ambitious projects given the GST quest and the DRDO sponsoring agencies for that. And then finally, if there is time, I will elaborate on this quantum network experiment, which is a fantastic experiment that we did. Uh, yeah, it will be interesting for, uh, particularly for students to understand. So uh, first coming to uh, the introduction. So as we all know, right, uh, I mean, it has been seen uh, for enhancing computing power, right, or computational power, right, there are two different routes that one may follow. First of all, we can interconnect several units and make the, you know, make a large network such that, you know, ultimately the computing, the computing power is uh, enhanced. Or we can make their components smaller, thereby fitting more and more ICs into uh, a simple chip, right? So, you know, uh, people are more interested on this particular uh, aspect where, you know, uh, we try to make it and therefore we have several, you know, improved versions of uh, the computers, the Pentium, you know, the, the series, the history about all of that. So we can actually make the components quite small and this was a paper, of, um, and I'm sure there are other papers and people have done much better, but these are the two examples that I specifically thought of when I so in 2009, actually, you know, in, uh, this is like a benzene thing, right? It serves as a single molecule transistor, right? And uh, it is between uh, two gold uh, electrodes, as you can see, and this entire thing can work as a transistor, right? So this is like a single molecule. And then similarly, another paper in 2015 that came out about the molecular size transistor that can be both to control the flow of single electrons, right? Another work. Few years, you know, people are trying to do it better and better. So we've actually hit the level of a uh, single molecule and uh, maybe a few atoms, right? So according to the Moore's law, as we all know, uh, the quantum technology gets closer. So we know that you know every alternate year, the, the amount of uh, components that we can then fit back into our IP is uh, doubling and. And therefore, by so if we just invert it, so the number of atoms that we would need to encode for the of information is decreasing. Uh, and so by the so 2020 has already passed. So so by, during this time, so that's why we are all concerned about you know uh, the quantum effects, right? So they start playing an important role because when we are talking about the few atoms, their physics and everything is quite different. So it is different from you know playing with macroscopic uh, objects, right? So we definitely have to start thinking about quantum effects, the physics and the world that they understand, we have to start understanding and you know building our systems depending on that. So this was a new uh, thing earlier for researchers and uh, but you know why not take advantage of them rather than getting scared about this new uh, physics and you know how these new quantum systems would be made, you know we have to uh, start taking advantage of them and therefore that was the birth of quantum information processing. So um, yeah, so at the heart of quantum information processing, as you know, there are the quantum bits. So just to compare them with the classical bits, we, we know all of this. So a classical bit is, uh, you know, uh, is dichotomic. It has two states, one or zero. And you can just have these two states in one bit. So if you, let's say, have n bits, there are in total two to the power of n uh, uh, states overall that you can play with and use in your uh, computational processing. Right. The other part, so in the quantum world, or if you're using quantum objects for your uh, physics and experiments, right, then you're rather worried about qubits, which is at the heart of uh, quantum information, right? So qubits are also dichotomic, but in addition to that, they are actually, uh, they have an infinite, so actually there are infinite number of possibilities. So of course, there are two basis states, which are zero and one, and usually a qubit is represented in a block sphere or a Poincaré sphere, whatever you, so these are the terms, right? so block sphere you usually use if you're talking about atom, atom is a quantum object, right? So it's also, it is also like a two-state system, but there is like, there are lots of superpositions also possible if you just start with two states, two basis states, right? 
So Bloxia is usually the term that is used in uh, uh, like interaction department. Point is something that is used uh, when we're talking about photons because photons can also particularly, you know, there are different properties of photons. So you can have them in different kinds of uh, states. So let me say, so if the poles are marked as state one and state zero, which are the two basis states, so a vector that is pointing whose origin is at the center of the sphere and uh, the tip of the vector can move about on this uh, sphere, on the surface of the sphere, and the tip or the direction of the tip will tell you what the state is all about. So as you can see, there are all kinds of superpositions. So A and B is like arbitrary. You can, so depending on A and B, the, the vector would point at some position on the uh, surface of the sphere. So in that case, there are infinite number of possibilities there to have. Uh, so if you just start with one qubit, one, one quantum system that has uh, in, uh, like uh, two basis states, but in terms of them, you can have infinite number of other possible states. So this enhances the state space of operation. So if you have, this is about one qubit. So now if there are n qubits, you can actually have p to the power of n basis states. But in terms of them, you can have again infinite p to the power of infinite number of possibilities. So it exponentially expands the state space of operation, and that gives you the power uh, which is there in quantum information and quantum computing in comparison to, uh, to classical computing. Now, some example of qubits, if you choose photon as your quantum offset, as you know, there are different properties of photons. Photons are color or frequency. They have polarization. They have orbital angular momentum. There is also, you can also play with this information as to where, you know, in a particular mode, like if you imagine a beam splitter, so there are two output modes, right? So you can also imagine if there is an absence or a presence of photon in a particular mode. So all these things, and so these can be taken as two state systems, right? So it can act on the qubit, and any properties can act on the qubit. So here I've shown very simply polarization. So if you imagine that this is zero, which is horizontal, and this way, which is vertical polarization, is one. Right? So in terms of this, you can have these superposition, so you can come up with diagonal or circular polarization, or in fact, elliptical polarization, and there are several other possibilities that are there, right? any other superposition. But it, it, it's always easy, particularly if you're talking about photons, it's always easy to work with their polarization property because of the optics that is inverse. So therefore, that is the most uh, you know popular uh, property that is used. But nowadays, there are also other things, for example, uh, orbital angular momentum. And mark me, and I might be wrong because when I said nowadays, because this is also, you know, people have been uh, working on orbital angular momentum for a very, very long time. Also, Professor Arti Singh, and others, I might be missing out. I'm uh, sorry about that. But even abroad, right? So, this is the physics. Uh, about this orbital angular momentum property of photons is also very, um, like, you know, it's quite uh, old and people have been exploring this. But nowadays, I mean, I think it's become more popular because now we want to apply all of them to the photons. The classical part of orbital angular momentum has been already very well. So this is another property. So, and um, uh, just like a spin, we also have orbital angular momentum for photons. So uh, with this, I mean, just like polarization, this is like, you know, a two-dimensional system. Here you can have a higher-dimensional system. You are exploring this particular property. So that is another way. So you can have a qubit and import them in any, any one of these properties. Now, if you talk about, so this was about photons. If you have two-level atoms, then, you know, there are different levels. And you can also think about with, uh, different kinds of lasers and driving things. You can create a superposition. Uh, coherent superposition of these two states. Similarly, if you have electron spins, there is up spin, there is down spin. So you have uh, the basis states, and then you can define different superposition states. Right? So these are certain qubits which we can uh, utilize in uh, understanding uh, or you know, doing these uh, basic applications of quantum information processing. Some of the popular ones. There are also others uh, which I will talk about. So, uh, okay, so a little bit, this is a small slide, just to uh, compare a uh, little bit how classical information processing would compare with quantum information processing. So just uh, a summary, let's say. Right? So classical information processing is based on two state classical systems, which can actually act between on and off, or zero and one. 
And uh, on the other hand, quantum information processing relies on qubits, which are made out of quantum systems. It's again a two-stage system basically, but you have the powerful tool of having them also in superposition states, right? So there it, it becomes infinite similar, you know, the state space of operation enhances. Now for classical information processing, you are uh, relying on local operations that depends on logical gates like AND or NOR, et cetera. On, for quantum information processing, you rely on unitary operations on these qubits, right? Then, and because of them, we can also have quantum logic gates. All these things are very easy to talk on in one slide, but actually when people try to do them with uh, actual practical system in the lab, it's quite, quite challenging because uh, quantum systems are not easy to play with, or quantum objects, rather. Even, you can, it's, it's difficult to have, it's still a little easier to probably have single photons in the lab, but a single atom, a uh, single, uh, a single quantum system, especially if it's uh, a storage or a processing unit, is very, very difficult or challenging to have in the lab, particularly because of uh, stability issues, you know, you need high vacuum, you need laser tools, lots of other stuff, right? So all these things, also quantum logic gates, it's not very easy to have them. Uh, so these are all technologically quite challenging, but let's see if you have the so quantum information would depend on all of this. And then again, uh, classical communication relies on your cables, buses, and networks, right? You can interconnect several units that people know about them. Whereas quantum information processing have other kinds of uh, you know, communication tools. For example, entanglement is one powerful thing. That is another very you know, special aspect of quantum information, as we all know. Like superposition, entanglement is another aspect. And in fact, for QKD, we would know that uh, non-cloning is another aspect, which is not there in uh, classical information. So with the help of entanglement, you can actually interconnect several nodes in a quantum network. So uh, the techniques, so the, the second part, techniques of producing single entangled uh, photons and recent studies from our group. So as I had already mentioned, so I will just briefly go through this uh, particular process of spontaneous parametric down conversion, as we all know, is a tightly nonlinear optical process. It produces pairs, it is supposed to produce pairs of photons. And uh, so you have to be very careful about your pump power. When you keep to low pump powers, it's mostly the most probable effect uh, the, uh, the events are pairs of photons, which is a signal and an ideal. They come out together. They are brothers. They are twin brothers, actually. They are born together. So that's why one can play with time correlation between these two photons and all of that. And sometimes they also come out, you know, being, uh, being correlated in some other property. For example, uh, frequency as well as polarization. Frequency, why do I say? So this is, so this entire process takes place under energy conservation. The pump photon has a particular frequency. So the signal and the ideal, their frequencies should add up to the frequency of the pump photon. And this is uh, governed by the energy conservation. Right? So this uh, particular process takes place under that conservation. So in, in addition to that, the process also um, conserves momentum. So you know the, all the wave vectors that should add up to give you, the output wave vector should add up to give you the pump wave vector. But sometimes there is a small, uh, sometimes or most of the time, there is a small uh, wave vector mismatch, and there are techniques in nonlinear optics in order how we tackle this particular uh, thing. And uh, we would like to have, uh, so have this particular equal thing so that we have efficient generation of signal and ideal of photon. Right? So, um, so like frequency, there these two photons are always correlated. So if one is, uh, you know, their frequency should add up together to give you the pump photon frequency. So like that, there is a particular, there are different kinds of phase matching which you tackle through the momentum conservation. So you have type zero, type one, and type two phase matching. So I'll come to those uh, before. Yeah, I have a few slides on them. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll come to the different types of phase matching, but just before that, so just if you see it as a process, you know, in a 3D, if you imagine this is a non-linear type two crystal, so some of the examples of these crystals are lithium nanobates, uh, potassium titanate and phosphate, beta barium borate. Uh, there are lots of others, uh, many, many non-linear optical materials that have non-zero right? So this is, let's say, a vivo crystal, BVO, right? And this generally uh, comes out. So you, so the, the wave vector comes out because these are all vectors, as you imagine. So they come out in different angles, the signal and the ideal. 
beauty. So if they're coming out in free space and different angles, they should conserve momentum and they come out. So this is a particular geometry where we have non-collinear, non-degenerate photons being emitted out of the crystal. So this is the wave vector lets out the pump, this particular line, and the signal and either photons come out in these two rings. So they form a cone. Right. And suppose if you had your detectors here, you would be able to see the signal photon. If you had your other detector, signal photon detector here, you would be able to see your uh, or detect your uh, idler photon. Right. So this is a non-degenerate, non-collinear geometry. Sometimes it can be non-collinear, collinear, but uh, you know the photons are degenerate. They are of the same frequency. So each of them being half of the pump frequency. Then they come out in a single cone. It is very difficult to separate them in that uh, case. Right. Sometimes the emission is collinear, so you can actually, uh, one can ask them while you're fabricating the crystal and you want a particular type of uh, geometry, so there are different kinds, so either you can, uh, uh, you can control the angle as well as the temperature, so there are several aspects, I'm not going to do a lot of details into this, but you can also have collinear geometry, whereby the signal aligner, they come out in a single spatial mode, and then by some technique, you have to separate them. Right? And then you can have them. So uh, now there are also different kinds of multi-phase matter. So you can have type 0, type 1, and type 2. So here, so type 0 is a particular type of phase matter where you have the polarization of the pump, signal, and idler, all of them same. So either all of them are extraordinary or all of them are ordinary polarized photons. Now type 1 is when the signal and idler have the same polarization, either ordinary or extraordinary, but they are orthogonal to the pump. And type 2 is a special case when the signal and the idler, they come out with orthogonal polarization. So if one is extraordinary, the other is ordinary, and vice versa, right? And extraordinary and ordinary, uh, not all of you are familiar with, but this is just, you can just imagine them as horizontal and vertical photons, right? So they have, so if, if the signal and idler are orthogonal polarization, then it's type 2. Otherwise, if they are of same polarization, they are either type 0 or type 1. Right, so with those uh, aspects, maybe so that was the case. So what we do in the group is we uh, have, uh, so there are several crystals and waveguns that we have. For example, uh, one of the best materials is lithium ionic, right? Uh, there are several such as optically transparent over a wide range of temperature. It offers high nonlinear coefficient. Quasi phase matching is possible. So this was as a first example, we chose this waveguide and uh, we have this. So we do a lot of uh, so before we could have a uh, theoretical study and see you know what kind of uh, uh, photons our uh, waveguide is uh, made to give, for example, right? So um, we wanted to do a theoretical analysis first, right? And uh, so we found out the refractive index profile. So this is the refractive index profile of the waveguide. So this is how it looks from the top. And this is from where you would treat in your pump beam. And in the output, you would have the signal and idler coming out in a collinear fashion. Waveguide is always supposed to uh, send you the signal and idler because it's a guided wave. So it gets guided in one mode. And you can have different modes uh, depending on different other uh, aspects, right? Just depending on the um, refractive index contrast and several other things. Right? So this is a work that is there and we have this. And uh, maybe I can skip this slide because this is about the material aspect. But we did a second harmony generation experiment with this. And we have also looked at SPDC uh, results with this. So uh, this is something. So these are our results on uh, second harmonic generation. The SPDC counts are pretty low and uh, we are, yeah, sorry. Hello. Uh, so the counts are pretty low. I do not have a plot for that for the moment, but we are working on that. Now, this is an interesting piece of work that we did on this uh, waveguide. So we wanted to play with the different kinds of modes because when we signal, because it's a waveguide, the signal and the idler come out in different modes. So let's say the waveguide supports a certain mode. This is the fundamental mode, let's say zero, zero, and this is how the mode looks like. If it is the first uh, first excited mode or the first antisymmetric mode, it is one, zero, or zero, one, let's say. So it looks like that. So that is an odd mode. This is an even mode. And as you know, all these processes, particularly the process of uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion that we're talking about, also conserves parity. 
So if you are starting with a pump that is in your fundamental mode, that is what you shoot in into your waveguide, the this signal and the items would come out is the combination of both fundamental, I mean like both even mode or both on mode. Right. So this is a property that we wanted to explore in this first study. And uh, all these simulations actually also help us to, uh, you know, understand that we wanted our waveguide to emit 1550 photons, regenerate photons, so both signal and ICAR at the same wavelength, and we wanted them at the fundamental mode, right? So we saw that after doing uh, certain studies, we saw, so we actually had to calculate the overlap, the mode overlap, and you know, lots of other things, and we we understood that in the fundamental, the highest probability, so this is, you know, this mode overlap gives you also a number of the, the probability in which the photons would come out, right? So maybe I'm not getting into a lot of details, but just to tell you that the second probable event, which is about the mode overlap was about 0.2, so there, there are different kinds of possibilities, right? So there are different modes in which these photons can come out. So this, this one was possible when both of them were in the anti-synaptic mode. So that was also possible, but of course you would not get the photons speed generate at 1.55, right? The, their frequencies would change. Because at the background of all of this is your phase matching uh, condition. So under the same phase matching condition, of course you would have different kinds of frequencies if you have, if it is in these modes, the one you and the one you. So uh, then we were actually, we wanted to do a joint spectral amplitude study. This is an interesting, uh, you know, this the joint spectral amplitude actually characterizes the joint spectrum of the emitted signal like the photons. And with that, we can actually extract information about the different degrees of freedom of the photon <coughs> and their quantum correlation. For example, it tells us whether the emitted photons are positive or negatively correlated whether the photons are separable or entangled, and all of that. <coughs> uh, one second. <coughs> so actually, the JSA, it depends on your uh, pump envelope function, which is defined this way, it basically depends on your conservation condition, right? And depends on the pump property. So the sigma p actually tells you the width, particularly if you are, you know, this becomes important if you are using a pulse source as the pump. The phase matching function uh, actually uh, tells you conserve and is, is about the, the momentum conservation, right? Condition. So this delta beta is actually the delta k, the small wave vector mismatch that I talked about. So it depends on that. And um, you know the joint spectral amplitude is actually a product of these two uh, functions, right? So we wanted to understand the same thing for our wave right? And uh, typically, this is just uh, <coughs> it's just a slide to understand that if your pump envelope function, so if you plot it against the either frequency and signal fre signal frequency on the two axes, this is how the plot looks like. Uh, so let's say this is a pump envelope function, and this thickness of this shaded portion depends on your uh, pump width, which is sigma p, which is there in this expression. Similarly, the phase matching function depends on your phi, which is the mode function, which depends on your delta beta, which is the conservation condition for momentum. And the thickness of this particular shaded region depends on the length of the crystal. It's inversely proportional to that. And ultimately, the culmination would be, uh, you know, product of these two, you get the JSA, which is actually like, you know, in a simple uh, way, you can say it's an overlap of these two. And therefore, the, the intersection area is like this elliptic region. Yeah? And this, you know, the orientation of this ellipse, the thickness of this, the shape of this, whether it's an ellipse or a circle, all these things give you different information about what kinds of photons are produced. Okay, no, I'm not going to go details on this, but uh, for example, yeah, this slide here. So if the ellipse is uh, not an ellipse, let's say if it's a circle, then you know it's a separable state and your photons can be separable, right? So they are not entangled. But if it's more like an ellipse, particularly if it's negatively, uh, you know, uh, oriented like this, so negative, with a negative uh, angle uh, to these two axes, it is uh, an entangled thing. 
So all these, you know, the, there's a wonderful thesis by Eckstein. We learned a lot from this, but this is all there, and it's quite very vertical. One can actually Google about joint spectrum amplitude, and you get many pieces that uh, talk about the basics of this. So we wanted to play with that and see what you know what what does it say about the photons that are expected out of our data. And we learned the same for us. So this is something that we explored. And uh, actually, we played with a Gaussian pump initially. And so Gaussian pump means it's you know the pump is basically we want them want it to be in the fundamental mode of the waveguide, right? And we were looking at different kinds of processes as I marked uh, earlier. So, um, <clears throat> the joint spectral intensity is actually a mod square of the joint spectral amplitude, and this is something actually you can measure when you uh, measure coincidences in the lab. So, you have two single photon detectors one detecting the ISO, one detecting the signal. And if you do a coincidence detection with the time correlator, you can actually what so the manifestation of GSI would be those coincidence detections, right? So you can actually uh, play with that. So maybe one interesting because in, in, uh, maybe I'm nearing time, so I want to go into other studies. I think it's uh, taking a lot of time. Should I? How much time do I have? Uh, do I still have uh, a few minutes, like uh, half an hour or so? Okay, maybe I can know. So this is another interesting study that we Joy, you have enough time. Joy, you have okay. enough time. Please okay, great, on. great. So I'll just carry on. Hmm? Because yeah. I, I think I will, yeah. Okay, so uh, we uh, studied about hyperentangled biphoton states. We utilized this particular wave, guys. And here, instead of a fundamental pump, actually we wanted to shoot in a, um, a, a pump mode, which is uh, a pump which is, you know, which would excite the one zero mode of the waveguide. So basically in an anti-symmetric mode. So these Hermann Gaussian modes can actually give you, so this is it's just a very uh, simple uh, uh, simple uh, expression to show you that, and you can program uh, with the help of spatial light modulators or certain other optical techniques out of a laser and you know the light that comes out of a fiber, you can make it pass for a spatial light modulator and you can do programming and you can have uh, a pump beam that is in an anti-symmetric mode. And that would excite the anti-symmetric mode of this waveguide. So let's say you start with a one zero pump mode, then you know, conserving parity, the signal and the idler would be always emitted in you know opposite. So the signal is in a fundamental mode, the idler will be in a anti-symmetric mode. Right. And secondly, if the signal is in a symmetric mode, the idler would be in an uh, sorry, uh, if the signal is in anti-symmetric mode, the idler would be in a symmetric mode to conserve parity, right? So this is something that we looked at, and we looked at the single one configuration that would give you that. Now, one phase matching condition dominates that your pump is a horizontal polarization, your signal is a horizontal, your idler is a vertical. So this is a particular type of type two phase matching, and with a taking pump uh, wavelength at 687 nanometer, we got a, a lambda one. Lambda one is like a polling period. So these are details about how you would, you know make the type 1, type 2, different kinds of phase matching actually possible in your crystal. So as you see, these are the different polling, you know, so the crystal is, uh, uh, they are, there are different, you know, domains, uh, regions through which uh, all these three beams would go. And this is a lot of detail about quasi phase matching, so I'm getting into the details. So lambda 1 is uh, something that the gradient constant is about uh, 6.5 micrometer, and with that, this particular phase matching is utilized. And under that, you have two different processes. As I said, the signal and the idler could be symmetric or anti-symmetric, but this is a vice versa possibility, and they are both of the equal weight. So they are both equally probable, let's say. And that probability is given by these numbers, which are given by the mode overlap. Right? And we saw that uh, these two processes, always the signal is produced at 1.55, whereas the idler is produced as at 1.22. Now, another kind of phase matching where you could slightly change the uh, the, the grating constant and you can have the signal as vertical and idler as horizontal. Again, type 2, but this time the signal is vertical and the idler is horizontal. Again, so these two, two additional processes are possible. 
Now these two gray things, lambda one and lambda two, could be you know used in uh, either you can have biperiod uh, polling periods or you can have cascaded polling periods, one on top of the other. And these are again you know uh, fabrication techniques. And I would not say uh, very easy, but there are companies that do such techniques. The biperiod uh, polling period. The bi-period folding is actually more probably a little bit more easier to do uh, rather than cascaded, and there are considerations. But with such folding uh, periods or folding techniques, one can actually realize this particular situation. So when such a situation is possible, we went on to uh, see the the different uh, you know JSIs that would be possible because of this and because of these two. And let me go into that. Yeah, before going to the JSI, maybe just quickly uh, this thing. So, uh, so these four graphs, as you can see, so this is like you know the phase matching graph, which is plotted against the signal region, and it will do a similar thing plotting against the idler region. So, but let's take one by one. So, the six square function, which is actually your uh, phase matching function, the delta because it depends on your delta theta. It tells you that all these four processes, which I talked about, right? All these four possibilities because of the dual polling that you have in your in your crystal, you know, they have a common overlap region. They are all different sync functions, but they have a common overlap region, which tells you that there are certain signal photons that would come out, let's say, between 1549.5 to 1550.5 or 7. Right, so within this particular region, where we would be unable to tell whether it came from the first process, the second, the third, or the fourth process, because they are coming out in an overlap. They have certain, they, they are all at 1550 micrometers, right, because it's centered at 1550, surrounded around 1550, and it will be difficult, the situation will be ambiguous to tell whether it came from which process. Right? Similarly, for the idler, it, it has to be the same. And therefore, this gave us the insinuation that maybe let's look at the joint spectral intensity just to see if there are certain overlap regions. So if you see that there is, so this is the pump envelope intensity, which is just the mod square of pump envelope function. This is the phase matching intensity, the second plot. And the third one is the joint spectral intensity. So as you can see that there are certain overlap regions of this phase matching intensity plot where, you know, all these four processes overlap. And when you try to do a culmin, uh, like you do uh, overlap with the pump envelope intensity, you get a J sign. So this is, uh, you know, the zoomed portion of this one. So all these inverted ellipses. So there are four inverted ellipses of the J sign, right? And all of these ellipses, they have a common overlap region, which tells you that you know this could uh, give you a hyperentanglement situation of the signal like the photons that are coming out. Both the signal and idler, you know, there are certain overlapping points, overlap regions of all these four processes where we'll be unable to say from which process they came from. And let's say if we can, in our experiment, if we are able to, uh, you know, if we are able to um, filter out our photons or not, filter is not the right word, but let's say we can detect within that quickly, within those wavelengths, then we can hope to have a hyperentangled by photon state. Of this uh, particular journal. So, this work, we were excited about it, and this uh, work was also published uh, last year. And we have uh, more after that. So, the work is ongoing. So, just with all that, I mean, I talked a lot about PPLN, but that was in type two. So, we have another waveguide, which we do it in type zero uh, phase matching, whereby the signal and the idler they are of the same polarization. And this is another work, and this is part of the GST Quest work. So here we have uh, started testing uh, SAG, which is the first thing to do. And this is, uh, I'll come to the details about this project, but just, just to tell you that this is similarly another way of kind. And uh, we have seen good SAG results with this. We have started with our SPDC results, which are very preliminary. Uh, at this point of time. So this is a project that is ongoing. But these are different kinds of photons because they are of the same polarization. So there is a different mechanism to separate out these photons. So because we cannot rely on polarization for this particular thing. And if, if, if we are not doing a cyanide interferometer and if we are not doing something else, we cannot think about uh, uh, directly polarization and dynamic in this. But this particular project actually involves the cyanide and uh, we hope to 
um, uh, entangle the photons in a AG plus BB kind of a configuration in this particular box. So that's ongoing. Another project where we actually have a PPKTP crystal. So this one is not in a wave guide anymore. This is a pure, uh, this is a bulk crystal, and this is a potassium titanium crystal. This is part of our DRDO APC project. And again, here we have uh, tried uh, testing. Um, uh, so we have seen our initial SAG powers, right? This temperature, we have scanned the wavelength of the pump. Uh, so, and we have also tried to see the SAG power if it gets enhanced with the pump power. And you know, all of this follows. So these are all routine checks that we need to do before we can be sure of, you know, before going to SPDC. So uh, that is what uh, is being done, and we have uh, again started, you know, using our single photon detectors, which has just arrived in the lab, for pertaining to the to this particular wavelength, and we have started seeing counts. But I didn't want to show the results here because they are quite preliminary. And we are actually also interested in this particular project to to explore orbital angular momentum properties of photons, whereby we would use certain, you know, optical tools here. Um, there are certain tools like two plates and S width plates, spiral face plates, with which we can actually and spatial light modulators. So these are just the, the toolbox for uh, looking at and detecting uh, orbital angular momentum of photons. Right? So this is something that we want to combine with this particular experiment, and we want to see more of that, which I will, uh, which I will probably maybe detail in a couple of times after this. So just before that. So that was the work with uh, a PPKTP crystal, but we also have another theoretical work, which is a little interesting because again, it involves a PPKTP waveguide. So the group is also in parallel exploring uh, theoretical science, what all we can do with these waveguides or crystals on a theoretical aspect and certain, of course, we are, uh, we are trying to uh, meet with our experiments as fast as possible. So this was another work where we explored the generation of two different polarization entangled by photon space in a single PPKTP waveband. So this one was like, so if you could produce phi plus bell state as well as phi plus bell state using the same waveband. Again, this is utilizing different type of, uh, you know, polling, bipedal polling or cascaded polling and stuff like that. Right? This is an interesting piece of work. I just wanted to flash that slide. If you are interested, maybe we look into this particular um, uh, publication, right? Uh, then, yeah, so apart from all of that, so that had all to do with spontaneous parametric down conversion and the emission of photons to that particular type of technique. But as, as I mentioned earlier, we also have interest in spontaneous four wave mixing, which is a type three process. And uh, so our group is also working towards that. So just like SPDC, the SFWM also actually obeys uh, uh, conservation of energy as well as conservation of momentum. So this is what procured instead of a single pump photon, since it's a type 3 process, you actually take two pump photons that convert into two, like a sig signal and a micro photon. And all of them should add up to degree zero. Their frequencies should add up to degree zero. Their uh, wave vectors should also add up to degree zero, which says that you know there should be conservation of energy as well as momentum even in this particular process. Now, this spontaneous four wave mixing, we have uh, started exploring in silicon nano wave bands. And uh, so we are, of course, initially we are doing some for uh, theoretical studies, but uh, we have started our experimentation and because we are not fabrication experts, so it has to be, the, the nano wave guys have to be fabricated from there. So we rely and we have a collaboration with a group of Professor Vijay Krishna Das in IIT Madras, and we are also trying to explore other options uh, for other different kinds of nano silicon nano wave guides, if we can have it on a chip or something like that. Okay. Right? So we are exploring different options, but this is a current, uh, like this is with our designs, no, the, the group of Professor uh, Vijay Krishna Das uh, fabricated one silicon nano wave guide, uh, which was uh, silica clad. So they have certain uh, routine designs on which such things should be uh, fabricated. And we uh, checked our first. Actually, so this is how the silicon on insulator wave like structures look like. So they are usually clad by silica on top or below, or sometimes they are air clad, which is like this. And uh, there are fabrication techniques, but one can expect to produce broadband photon type generation through such through this process and in silicon nanowave lines. 
nanobase dyes, of course, the dimensions are different from what we were speaking about earlier uh, regarding our Chi 2 base dyes. Right? So, there the dimensions were of micrometers. Here, the dimensions are of 200 nanometers. So, those are differences. But uh, there are certain routine steps. Here, we have to worry about certain other things. So, using ComZone programming, first we do a lot of simulations to check the design and to see, you know, what kind of particular design or, you know, dispersion engineering would give you a particular kind of uh, property of photons. So, that is what we deal with. There's a lot of detail in this. So, uh, there is this fantastic book by G.P. Agarwal and lots of publications from his group. People know this. He's an expert in uh, fiber and nonlinear optics. Uh, so, uh, we learned a lot from that and we did our simulations and everything from that. If, you are, if students are particularly interested, they know, but this is anyway at the heart of any, you know, third order non linear optical technique. So, uh, with using, uh, using all of that, you know, uh, we try to generate or we try to look into the generation rather, this is theoretical, you know, simulation based work. So, nano wave guide designs into 20 nanometer silicon on insulator uh, wave guide for ultra band. Uh, ultra broadband for wave mixing at telecom basins. So this is something that we saw that our designs are uh, possible. So this is a theoretical study. So uh, this is, let's say, the four wave mixing bandwidth. These are little different from what we expect in round conversion. And we did certain checks, like, you know, the, the width of this, how tolerant, you know, what are the different widths that can tolerate. Because while fabricating, you're not sure to fabricate the nanometer dimension. So you have to be very uh, particular, but even fabrication techniques come with some, some plus minus, you know, there has to be a tolerance, right? So we wanted to you know, see what is the angle tolerance, we wanted to see what is the width tolerance, height tolerance, and all of that while fabricating. So these are uh, like very crucially dependent on the dimension of this uh, particular uh, wave band, right? And we saw certain designs which were compatible, and uh, this was given. So let me just skip through. So this is like <clears throat> This is the collaboration that I was talking to, and this is an experiment that we, uh, because um, Professor Dasi's lab and I team Madras, you know, hosts, they can routinely check these waveguides, the fabrication, and these are actually grating, uh, so they are grating couple. So on either side of it, so particularly because the dimensions are nanometer, uh, right, uh, you need grating couplers at the end of it. Uh, both ends of it in order to couple the lights well and couple out lights. Right? So you need to couple in the pump photons and couple out the signal and idler photons, right? So there are certain, uh, so electron beam lithography is the technique uh, that we use and uh, plasma reactive ion etching is something. So those are the details uh, that we use in fabricating and we try to run this experiment uh, which is by the use of certain uh, lasers that we had, particularly telecom lasers that we had, and edge pumps. And uh, we saw our uh, four wave mixing signal, so we were very happy. So this is still all uh, classical. We have not gone to the spontaneous level really. But nevertheless, if you have a pump beam, then on either side of it, you know, so, you know conserving energy, you, we could see the generation of the idler and the signal photon. Right? And this work, uh, so it shows that, you know, that our designs are working properly and, and experimentation is possible. And then we can actually rather go to, uh, you know, to signal photon regime, single photon regime, right? So we want to uh, get that waveguide transported to our lab and we would uh, further do experiments with them. So that is the status of that particular uh, experiment. And uh, so, okay, some interesting upcoming endeavors which we have from our first and Yagyo project, which I briefly mentioned uh, earlier, but let me just mention a little bit in detail. So, this is uh, just before that, uh, just before that, I think we also have, uh, we had rather this project has now gone over. So, we have uh, a sort of VMR project where we utilize this uh, lithium wave, uh, wave guide. And we wanted to produce twin photons, exactly photons from this. The twin photon is something we have seen. Entanglement is uh, something that we are working towards in that. So that was one, that is one thing that's 
there, then we have the Just Quest project, which is about uh, the generation of integrated sources of advantage cables for quantum, quantum communication and quantum information. In this, we actually aim to use the type zero PCLS waveline. We want to put them in a finite interferometer and we want to generate the signal and ideal photons and have them in an advantage state of like, you know, the five plus uh, state, which is eight days plus B B. Right. And then we want to actually, since this can be uh, it's a time zero process, we are interested in generating broadband uh, photons in this. We can channelize those photons and have them, you know, work towards a multi user PKD scenario. So, this is the goal of this particular project, and uh, we aim to uh, see that. Uh, that is ongoing. And, uh, and another work, uh, another project that we have is that we are doing the ATC project in which our goals are slightly different. Here we actually uh, use a crystal and other waveguides. We actually use two crystals, the VGO and the DCKT crystal. And the main goal of this particular project is to, you know, see, uh, is to first produce, generate hybrid photons. Uh, that would help us in secure communication and quantum information. So this would work towards, you know, some kind of a satellite to KD scenario. Um, I mean, uh, we all hear this is also a very you know, uh, hot thing to do a research on, and uh, these hybrid photons, well, why I say hybrid? Because they will have two kinds of information. One is polarization, and the other would be orbital angular momentum. And we would like to uh, produce hybrid qubits out of these. So let's say there is a signal photon and an idler photon. We would have hybrid information from polarization as well as orbital angular momentum. Details are not explaining a lot. But uh, so using these two, it would be important. Uh, you know, we can have them in a particular state where the total angle, so the the polarization is like your spin angular momentum. The orbital angular momentum is uh, the other the other part. So if these two properties are clubbed together in a smart way, so that is the crux of the project. But if we club it in a, and combine them in a smart way, we can have hybrid qubits that would have total angular momentum zero. So if the total angular momentum is zero, and especially if let's say if you imagine a situation where there are two satellites, or even if you're uh, between Earth and a particular satellite, right? One actually needs, if you're just playing with polarization properties, we would need a shared frame of reference, which, which is not possible if there are two different satellites, right? Because they are rotating and they are moving about in free space. But, you know, the, the polarization property needs a shared frame because the H and the V, the horizontal or the vertical polarization, is of course with respect to a particular frame of reference, right? So if these two these two satellites they don't have a common frame of reference then that will be difficult. So it is difficult just to play with uh, polarization because by the time you are trying to send polarization some polarized photon from this red satellite to the blue satellite, you know, you know the satellite might have rotated or then I mean you would not have the same frame of reference and you know the proper the, the information that you were trying to send through your H and B which is uh, ingrained in your H and B of the photon will now get distorted. So uh, in addition to polarization, if you also have orbital angular momentum and if you have a smart way of combining them, as I said, such as to have total angular momentum zero, then you know it does not depend on this uh, individual rotation of the satellite. Because ultimately, the qubit that you're measuring, the hybrid qubit, that would not depend individually on your polarization or orbital angular momentum, but it will depend on the total angular momentum, which is zero. So it does not undergo a rotation, and you will not have a distortment of information. Actually, the polarization of the spins would rotate in a different direction combined in, uh, in an opposite direction to the orbital angular momentum. This is something that I wanted to explain in these small things, but you know, it will take a little time to explain in detail. So, but that is the really the idea. And so this is uh, towards uh, free space PKD. So this is something that we are trying to uh, start in our lab now, and we have already started and we started seeing SHD and we are towards we have also started seeing at PDC. Uh, but those are preliminary, and soon once we explore whatever is there, like our actual setup. Which is not uh, which I which is not shown here, but uh, the main setup we would like to move it out in free space and see if it, if it can be possible. So beyond the lab space, if we can take it out in free space and see if it's two different buildings or things like that.
So that is the application of this particular piece. So for all this work that I've talked about right now, I mean, we have our group. So there are different, uh, many cases. There are some old cases here and the new cases are the same. So this uh, particular slide is a little outdated. But nevertheless, we have many group members, uh, people who are working on the waveguides and the crystals on uh, down conversion as well as spontaneous forming mixing. And uh, they are actually the task for the, the working force in our lab. Uh, that's what I wanted to thank them for all this. And we also have a tremendous team uh, helping and, you know, very, uh, very interested faculty collaborator, Professor Vivek Venkatraman. I should also mention him. He is from the Electrical Engineering Department in IT Delhi. We collaborate with him, we share students. And uh, so Rajni is our combined uh, member. Also, Shivani, who works on four wave mixing, the person who went to IT Madras. Uh, Om Shankar is the person who is uh, taking care of the CRTO JTC uh, project experiment, working on the DGKTP and uh, Debo Crystal. We have another student who is joining him to work on that. And we also have a temporary postdoc in that uh, in that direction, Mitali, uh, who will also join us uh, soon on that. So uh, earlier we had Ingo in our group who was in that uh, team. And then there is uh, Vikas uh, Yadav who is working in the, towards the DST Quest project and assisting him is Akansha Ambural whose photo is actually missing in this slide. I'm sorry about that. But I'm grateful to all these people. They're all working hand in hand towards uh, all of these experiments and it's exciting in the lab. So I don't know how much time I have. If I have just a few more minutes, maybe I would. So this was all about the things you that have, you have, currently. You have okay. enough time. You have 10 okay. minutes. You can talk. 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you so much. Huh? So this is the last experiment that I wanted to end with because this is an old piece of work, but it is very exciting. And I'm uh, proud about this work. So I thought maybe I could just uh, continue this. So, uh, so this last piece of work is about quantum networks using the single photons and single atom as quantum system. These single photons are again, you know, utilizing spontaneous parametric down conversion we need to produce these single photons. The single atom is actually a trapped ion, uh, which is there. So I'll explain that work. And uh, the credit goes to the lab of uh, Professor Jogan Echna and their group members. Initially, the group was in ICFO Barcelona in Spain. And later we moved on to uh, Saarland in Germany. So I was initially a Marie Curie postdoc there in Spain, in ICFO. And later on, after two years, we went to uh, Saarland. Where, uh, actually, after one and a half years, not totally, I was in ICFO. We moved to Saarland, where I spent two more years. So overall, let's say three and a half years, I was in the group. And uh, we could do these uh, fantastic experiments. And uh, I got a great, great experience. I'll never forget in life. And it also helped me the way I'm shaped today. Because during my PhD, I was not thinking about single photon so much. But it is, uh, I think I learned a lot during this. And has helped me uh, also establish my group in the current scenario. And in the group, uh, actually I forgot to mention, but we also, uh, so Rajni is a student that, we, that who works on, uh, on uh, coherent manipulation. So in on an EIT, so we also have a paper cell uh, in the video. So I just thought before going into this, I forgot to mention we also work on that. But I didn't have a slide to show, so nevertheless. So coming to this particular piece of work, actually this uh, single photon and single atom and their interaction together, you know, uh, the, the main idea is to have them club together in a quantum network kind of a scenario. Now, just before going into that, you know, just a small one or two slides to give you the, uh, you know, the flavor about this work. So qubits, although we talked about photons and atoms, but I did not explicitly mention that qubits are two types, right? Flying qubits and stationary qubits. As the name suggests, flying qubits are ones that travel across space. So they are the moving carriers of quantum information. So typically photons or electrons, those who are mobile quantum objects, they can serve as qubits, right? Either it could be a polarization state of a photon, presence or absence of a photon, the spin state of electron. All these things can, with all these properties, you can have flying qubits. Similarly, you have stationary qubits. Stationary qubits, as the name suggests, are localized in space. And they help to uh, store quantum information and also process it. 
right? So the stationary qubits actually serve to uh, serve to the efficient uh, quantum memories or quantum processors where information is stored and processed. Right, and also generated sometimes, right? So that is uh, the utility of our stationary qubits. And since they are localized in space, as we know, certain solid state systems or internal states of ions or neutral atoms, you can, if you can trap, you know, single atoms or single ions, or, you know, superconducting circuits for solid state systems, which are very, very uh, popular these days, or quantum dots, or energy centers in diamond, all those things can act, you know, artificial atoms, all those things can act as stationary qubits. Now, what do we do with the stationary and planet qubits? So, this is a famous, you know, um, picture from uh, thanks and credit to Kimball and his work, uh, group's work. So, uh, this was he, he actually uh, notioned about this quantum network scenario, and uh, this is a picture from uh, one of his papers. And uh, so this is, if you imagine, this is a quantum network. So these boxes are basically, or these cubes are rather the quantum nodes or the information centers they, where you can have the stationary qubits like atoms. And interconnecting them, the red arrows are your quantum channels, which can be, a star, which can be realized through photons. You know, either traveling between different from node to node, or you know, entangling them. Right. So uh, one such scenario is since we worked with uh, single trapped ions and uh, single photons to STDC. So let's imagine. So let's say if you have a trap where you can trap several of these ions, right? And you don't have one trap, but you have four such traps. Just imagine, right? So but they are trapping all same type of ions, right? So there are different ways by which you can do an information transfer between one stationary qubit to another, right? One is a direct quantum state transfer. So let's say this is a trapped ion, one of the trapped ions in a chain of ions, right? In one of the trap in a lab, let's say. So if you if an ion emits a photon of a particular kind, in another trap, that photon can travel, right? Either you carry it through an optical fiber or you can carry it in free space. There are pros and cons of both of this. But let's say you can carry the photon and get it absorbed by another ion, then there is a direct state transfer from this one to this one. Right? Of course, you have to optically prepare the ion. And there are lots of you know details that I'm skipping here, but in a very simple way, I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, give you the you know feeling about this. Another uh, you know way would be an entanglement transfer of the distinct atoms. So let's say if this atom in a trap emits a photon, this one emits a photon, and these two photons, if we superpose them onto a beam splitter, and then we do single photon detection, or we do some kind of a correlation measurement between these two uh, detectors, right? So then you would have an entanglement transfer from these two atoms to the two photons, and we would like to, like the the the, the idea would be to uh, have them entangled. Right by this me mechanism. So this is called projective measurements, and we can have the atoms entangled in the process. Another type of uh, process where you could, uh, like, you know, do a state transfer to uh, information transfer is by doing an entanglement transfer. So this is starting from atoms to photons, and this is the reverse of that, where you can start from entangled photons. So let's say you have an STDC crystal here. This is a pump uh, photon, and you know that signal and idea are emitted. So if the signal goes and gets absorbed by an atom in a trap, and the idler goes and gets absorbed by another atom in another trap. And if the signal and idler were initially entangled by some means, right? So when they are both absorbed at the same time by these two individual atoms, we can say that the entanglement property of the photons were now transferred to the two atoms, right? So in this way, they can they can actually the two atoms can get entangled, right? So this was a proposal that we actually uh, banked on, and this was given by Lloyd and his group uh, way back in 2001. And our group actually uh, wanted was uh, was motivated towards that. So we used the tools that we used was a linear pole trap to trap the ions. So this was a calcium ion. So it's just devoid of one electron, but basically like an atom, right? So it's a single atom. Let's say. Uh, so this is uh, this is just a picture to show you that the you know the, the trap is a, this is a very small very very small thing it is just a very bloated out a big zoomed out picture so these had these um, you know uh, diagonal electrodes right. 
So these electrodes, these electrodes to the diagonally opposite electrodes, you had RF frequency applied of different uh, polarity, and this would you know create help to create a saddle well potential. And so this is a potential well, but, but since these were radio frequency uh, fields that were applied to the electrodes, that would have a certain frequency like the omega f. So depending on the omega, we can imagine that this potential well is like a bowl. Right, so it is moving and it continuously, uh, so it, it, it moves uh, with this and you know the, the spirit of this is that the atom is at the center of this bowl and it is never allowed to escape this bowl, which means it is never allowed to escape this particular potential well, which is created out of these diagonal electrodes. In addition to that, you also have actual electrodes that would you know confine the atoms or the ions uh, in an actual direction and not so these are positive electrodes and as you can see calcium ions are repelled by them so they would remain at the center of the trap. So this is and there are of course lots of other technical technicalities that are involved like laser cooling. We have lots of uh, like you have two three lasers together uh, in order to cool them and keep them localized. So they are localized uh, so their movement is about 40 nanometer. Right? So they have to be extremely stable. The temperature has to be extremely, extremely low. And there has to be high vacuum. Then only you can actually imagine you have trapped single ions in a particular, in this particular uh, linear ball trap. Right? So that was uh, in a nutshell. Uh, this is how the physical trap looks like. Again, this is a very zoomed out picture. And these huge lenses are actually high numerical aperture laser objectives, which we call them as halo lenses. Numerical aperture is about 0.4. These are typically numbers that you would need to trap a chain of ions or a, chain or a single ion. We ultimately worked with the single trap ion. So in, instead of this chain of eight atoms here, there was a one atom. So of course, the, depending on the power of your lasers and different other parameters, several others, actually you would uh, uh, try to establish that situation, then you would have a single ion. And how you would uh, detect it, we detect it through the fluorescence that is emitted. So when you continuously laser cool these ions or these atoms, they emit uh, fluorescence photons. So, <clears throat> so these fluorescence, so these are actually real pictures which we derive from. So we how, how do we see the atoms, right? So we can only see them through a photomultiplier tube after we catch the fluorescence photons that are emitted by these ions. So these are fluorescence, actual fluorescence pictures of single atoms that we uh, see in the camera that is somewhere down in, in below this uh, trap. And so this is how the mess looks like. So these are two traps which are separated by a distance of let's say one, one and a half meters in a single optical table. So you can have other traps like this. Uh, you can show, <clears throat> you can do, uh, uh, you know, information transfer from one trap to another. But this is all said and done very easily. Said very easily, but not done so easily. It's tremendously technically challenging. So coming to the you know the picture. So this is the simple level structure of calcium that we were worried about, right? So when they are laser cooled, they are the atom is actually oscillating between these uh, levels and they are uh, emitting uh, blue photons, of course. And uh, these are several other metastable excitations. For example, the one at age 54 nanometers is something that we were interested in because we wanted the ions. So if we have to follow this particular scheme, we want certain photons that will be absorbed by the ion, right? So these red photons, so the, the wavelength that was chosen for the red photons was age 54 nanometers. Um, uh, which so uh, the design parameters for the photon pair source was of course they have to be time correlated photons because there is one trap and there is another trap so there is one calcium ion in one trap separated by one meter you have another calcium ion in another trap so we, you can put the you can like you can transfer the signal to one and the idler to the other one so that is basically the idea right so the signal and idler were non degenerate photons both at age 54 nanometer. Right? The design would uh, demand that they are time correlated, they're tunable and stable, and they're also narrow bandwidth. <clears throat> this particular transition or this uh, this uh, this one is, you know, uh, the lifetime in this excited state is seven nanoseconds, which makes that this uh, particular transition is of narrow bandwidth, it's 22 megahertz. That is what is expected of single trap ions. 
And so 22 megahertz is actually a very small bandwidth when it comes to SPDC photons. Because SPDC photons, people know in the community and other students might also know, they're actually quite broadband. Several gigahertz, hundreds of gigahertz are their usual bandwidth in which the signal and idler are emitted. So we have to filter them either or you know enhance them and have their bandwidth as narrow as possible down to 22 megahertz, which was extremely difficult. So that was one of the things. And within that narrow bandwidth, we need high brightness, which means that we need 10 to the power of 3 or 1,000 photon pairs per second, only within this narrow bandwidth. Otherwise, within a broad band, of course, they should be much more brighter. Right? And then, uh, of course, these photons should be polarization at angles. Uh, that is the property that we utilized in that. Uh, so this is the mess, how it looks. The photons were set up in a real life. This was all in one optical bent, and it was all covered inside uh, a box, right? This is the stuff, which is the box that we could cover. And, you know, on by doing remote uh, controlling, we can do certain things in, inside this box. For example, moving away, plate, and things like that. Otherwise, we never used to disturb the box. We keep it closed after doing the initial alignment and everything. Uh, <clears throat> because, uh, yeah, so that is how, so there is the la laser. So this is, this is a frequency double system. There are lots of other side. Maybe this is the setup. This is easier to look at. So on the source side, the photon source side, we had the master laser at 854 nanometer and the second harmonic generator. So this was all together in a frequency double system. And then uh, we had the TTKTP crystal uh, that would emit your signal and like the photons because that was the SPDC source that we were relying on. After that, we either have a polarizing beam splitter or a beam splitter, depending on what we are trying to do. So initially, we experimented with the PDS, so we were not interested in sending entangled photons, but we were just interested in sending correlated, time correlated photons to the atoms because you know, step by step, there were several steps to this particular uh, experiment and ultimately doing the entanglement transfer, which was actually quite hard to do at the end, and there were not too many events, unfortunately. Because uh, I'll tell you why, because one would probably be able to imagine the technical difficulty of this, but then let me just go through what I explained. So in order to boil down the bandwidth of the photons from several hundreds of gigahertz to 22 megahertz of interest, because the seven nanoseconds is the transition line width of this, and this is where within which the atom, the calcium atom would actually absorb a photon would have the probability because rest which is outside your 22 megahertz will not be under any circumstances be absorbed by the calcium ion. So there is no point in sending them or having them or looking at time correlation with those photons. So in, in the experiment or in the setup, we had these people, uh, these bandwidth filtering cavities. So there were two cascaded cavities. One would boil it down to 2.5 gigahertz and the second one starting from that would you know, uh, decrease the bandwidth of the photon to 22 megahertz. Yeah. Right? I, I would just wrap up. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I wrap up in a couple of minutes. That was. Uh, uh, that was yeah, 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 sure, sure, sure. Wind up. Yeah, so maybe uh, there's no not much time, but I just wanted to say that. So ultimately, the photons that are coming out of these filtering bandwidths, right? they would be of 22 megahertz of interest, and they would be centered at 854 nanometers, right? So this is degenerate. So with the help of the polarizing beam splitter, you have the signal. So let's say if it is reflected by the polarizing beam splitter, they are vertically polarized. So the vertically polarized photons can be sent to your atom, and the horizontally polarized photons could be sent to your filtering band cavity, right? So at the end of it, you can catch the uh, uh, the signal of uh, the idler and while the signal is going through the atom, on the atom side, there are several, you know, these cooling and pumping lasers that keep the atom optically pumped to this uh, D5 half level. In which, unlike if it is only in the D5 half level, the atom has a probability of absorbing that photon. Because when a photon of 854 nanometer comes from the source side, it will come and, you know, there could be a by chance. Maybe in a lucky event, it has reached the photon. So because these high numerical aperture laser objectives, they are trying to tightly focus the photon beam onto the atom. 
Right. So let's say in a lucky event, uh, the, uh, the photon got absorbed by the atom. So the atom would get excited to this level. And from there, you know, again, since the other lasers are on, it would come, it would get really excited after seven nanoseconds on an average. And, you know, when it gets really excited, it would uh, ultimately emit these 393 or 397 photons, which would be caught by the PMT. So these photons would be emitted. So there is another halo laser objective. So this is the photon beam and this is the photomultiplier too. So a click on the PMT would tell you that, you know, uh, there has been a successful absorption by the atom, which means one photon from the source has been absorbed. So a click on the PMT can be correlated with a click on the APB, which would actually catch the other, the partner ideal photon. So such processes or such events were correlated, and that was actually the key task of this one. So initially, we did this experiment with a polarizing beam splitter, where we were not looking at entanglement. Later on, actually, uh, so this was just to do with the, because this was the first of its kind, so this is heraldic single photon absorption by a single atom. Uh, this was the first of its kind that came out because all before this particular experiment, all the other experiments were people were mainly looking at emission of uh, photons from ions and not at single photon absorption by a single ion. Okay? So this was the first of its kind, and uh, after seeing this, actually we want we uh, maybe I skip these slides a bit because I just. So these are different, you know, the correlation events that I was talking about. So this blue trace is like a PMT click, and this red trace is by an APD. Here, if you see, so maybe very quickly. So maybe if I have a couple of minutes, I can explain. So this is if you if you have the iron uh, trust in this, or you know, optical pump to this D5 half level. So we follow the pulse interaction scheme. Initially, there was a cooling phase, then there is a stage preparation phase in order to prepare it in this D5 half, and then there is a detection phase. And all this while, there were photons going to the atom, but of course, the detection phase is dated, so we switch on our gate only in this dated phase, which is this, this point. So during the cooling and stage preparation, we don't switch on our detector, which is, uh, so we don't have counts from the... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so in the cooling phase, then you have the state preparation phase, then the detectors are gated off, both APD and PMT, and then finally the detection phase. So in the detection phase, the APD that is able to detect the ideal photon or the partner photon, whereas, you know, there could be an initial, as we see, so let's say the ion is prepared here, let's say a photon comes from the source, and, you know, by one chance, maybe this photon gets absorbed by the ion, the ion goes to the excited state, as I was saying, then it gets really excited after seven nanoseconds on an average, and it starts emitting these fluorescence photons, which can be caught by the PMT. So, you know, uh, in an, uh, spontaneously, the PMT would show, you know, these traces, the blue traces by the PMT. So if you can correlate the with the AP, the correlate the APD count with the PMT count, we can have several because it's in a pulse interaction scheme. So this this entire thing is a few microseconds, 85 actually sorry, 85 milliseconds, right? So we actually in in a in an experiment, this 85 milliseconds is repeated several times, right? So this is what the pulse scheme is all about. So we do these repetitions. So this is one 85 milliseconds, then another 85 milliseconds, and so on. So in so there are certain uh, there are certain phases where like there are certain you know entire phases where you don't have a single event but certain phases where you have certain events so we collect all those events several such events and we we try to see the coincidences in total you know 1800 seconds which is like uh, half an hour of time right and we try to uh, process or find the D to zero correlation. Correlation between the APG click and the PMT click. So that was at the heart of this experiment. And then we went on to see several things. These correlation spectra we saw against polarization, and we saw against the, you know, by decreasing the frequency of the photon. If we decrease the frequency of the photons, uh, maybe more details since I don't have time, just to tell you that that was only with the PBS. Next, our next shot was with a beam splitter, which would, uh, so, because we were interested in sending entangled photons now to the or coal or you know or the, so, so photons that would not let us know what is the polarization. So then, which means that we try to use the ion 
the craft iron as an optical detector. So just like you know, when when we would have entangled photon, we usually need a quarter wave plate, a polarizing beam with a half wave plate. All of that to do your polarization analysis on let's say a full tomography of these experiments. Right. So on one hand, we did that with the idler photon, which is the partner photon. On the other hand, uh, you know the other photon that was sent to the iron. The iron we we could prepare it in three different uh, mechanisms, in three different configurations rather, where one would be, you know, sensitive to H and G polarized photon. The, in the other configuration, the ion would be sensitive to diagonal and anti-diagonal photons. And in the third configuration, the ion would be sensitive to uh, circular photons, right? circularly polarized photons. So uh, because th that is what we intended to do, we wanted to do a full tomography uh, on the, so using iron as a quantum detector, you can say that. So in, in that way, this was a quantum square tomography, because rather than using, say, in one arm, we use the polarization optic, which is a quarter wave plate, half wave plate, and PDS. And in the other arm, for the other photon, the partner photon, we use the iron, which was itself a quantum detector, you know, serving like just an equivalent of a quarter wave plate, uh, uh, half a plate and TV and the iron itself, if you can prepare them in three different states, you'll be able to do this particular uh, tomography. So let me not go into detail, but just to tell you that these were the three different schemes. One, the iron is detecting in the L arm, which is left and right circular polarized photon. The, the other part, the iron is prepared and you know, sensitive to absorb only H and B photons. And in the third configuration, the iron is sensitive to absorb only B and E photons. And we did, uh, with the help of the half wave plate angle, we could do a polarization uh, spectrum by moving the half wave plate angle. So there is a half wave plate here by which we could turn and see, you know. Uh, uh, so that is that is what is expected when we do, uh, when we try to characterize entanglement of photons. We, we do this routinely with uh, the polarization of the plate. So uh, that is the thing. Uh, so this is the tomography, um, uh, the, the tomography analysis that we could use. And we say it's a quantum square tomography because uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is what we obtained. And we obtained a fidelity of 93.93% plus minus 4. It was extremely difficult. And uh, so the entanglement of the photons was in the sine minus state. This typically when you use type 2, uh, type 2 phase mapping and we use a beam splitter to separate them and then you do coincidence uh, detection, you actually map them onto a, a sign minus uh, state. Huh? So the, we check the fidelity of uh, this, uh, our, uh, our row, basically the density matrix which we had out of, you know, so all these events, we, so this is a typical tomography experiment, right? So uh, keeping the iron in different configuration and different settings of the quarter wave plate, half wave plate, and PDS, right? We could have all these uh, numbers there. So there were 16 such measurements done, and we could do this uh, thing. And uh, yeah, that was the that was the, uh, experiment. Right? So with that, maybe I would end. Uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm really out of uh, time. But yeah. okay, Jay. Thanks for allowing me a few more minutes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joey. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so uh, there are there are questions. Yeah. yeah, in chat box there are questions. Oh, I can read or yeah. you can also read. Yeah. Uh, like uh, there is question: Why does an odd mode not generate two even modes? This is one of the questions by Abhishek Bharadwaj. Why does an odd mode not generate two I'm even? I'm looking modes? at the chat box. Yeah. Why can... does an odd mode not generate two uh, even modes? Even modes because of parity, because two even modes would have even parity, and odd mode has an odd parity, right? So, you know, you have studied something called parity conservation, right? And anti symmetric, uh, so it will not be able to survive. Maybe it will generate, but it will not be able to survive. That is what, right? So, if you start with a symmetric pump mode, right, in the fundamental, or let's say even if you have a two zero or zero zero. Right? What you could uh, expect to come out or survive, maybe it will generate, but it will not survive because that is, uh, no, so actually I might be wrong. Somebody can find me, but this is, uh, this is out of parity conservation. Okay, yeah. 
So the then next. the second question is, is JSA related to intersection of the two cones of entangled pair? It is related to the, yeah, good question. Thank you for asking that. So JSA is actually the joint spectral amplitude, uh, but JSI is the more, uh, more you know, realistic, uh, realistic thing to talk about because JSI would give you the intensity, which I briefly mentioned, you know, so if you do coincidence measurements, Let's say you've split your two photons with the help of a beam split or PDS, whatever, right? And you have single photon detectors and you see coincidence measurements, right? It is a direct connection with your JSI, right? So it is related definitely to the intersection of the two cones because you would place your detector smartly on where the two cones would intersect. So if you're talking about a free space configuration, which is a non collinear configuration, if I might be able to go, let me allow me. Initial slide, right? Yeah. Yeah, this is a this is a picture. So this is a picture of two intersecting cones. As you see, so this is the cone for the eye blur. This is a this is a cross section. This is a circular cross section. So let's see your it's looking at, like looking perpendicular to the beam uh, direction, right? So this is the cone for the idler. This is the cone for the signal, let's say. Right? And these are the intersection regimes where the two circles intersect. Right? So those are the points where you cannot make out from which cone they have come. Right? So especially, so this is a picture for non-degenerate. So especially when they are non-degenerate, all the more, because otherwise you can do frequency measurements and you can filter them right? because they, they are of different colors. Right? But when they are of the same color, all the more you cannot specify from which cone they have come whether they are the top cone or the bottom cone, right? So those are the, those points of intersection are the points where the two photons are entangled, right? So you would smartly place your single photon detector here and here. You have two detectors for doing the coincidence measurement, and you would place them here and here and would look, try to look at the coincidence detections, right? And these coincidence detections is uh, true. Yes, they would give you a, uh, give you a manifestation of the joint spectral intensity, which is the more square of the GAC. And then by doing several such uh, measurements, um, depending on different kinds of uh, wavelengths of the signal and idle, so you can scan them, let's say, you can have them, you can have the GAC or the GSI plotted against wavelength, or you can have plot them against orbital angular momentum, or you can plot them against polarization. You can also scan the polarization, and you can also have a GSI uh, depending on that, on them, right? So the other question, the total probability to get two photons is around 0.4. What would be the other cases in this, the maximum probability, which, which this is pertaining to what? Abhishek? Abhishek Bharat. Probability to get uh, uh, two photons was around, one was having 0.2 something, other one was also having 0 0.2. You said they have an equal oh, probability. Oh yeah, for that, oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, right, so. You're talking about that waveguide scenario where we talked about the hyperentangle. This situation, this table you're talking about, that we could probably. Yes. Right? Yeah. So actually, total probability, you know, all these probability is, uh, yeah, you can say this is 0.4, this is 0.4 that way, right? But so this is a single event. This event is independent of this particular event. Now, this process is, so the only way they are connected is that when, you know, with a particular grating lambda one, right, a one zero pump photon can excite both these processes, zero zero signal and one zero idler, or one zero signal and zero zero idler. And these two processes are equally probable. If you want, you can say that the total probability is 0.4. But similarly, the other lambda two polling would actually excite these two processes. So in general, actually, so all of these processes, as you can see, they are equally. So if you treat them as individual processes, A, B, C, D, they are four different processes, and they are mostly, majorly, all equally probable. This uh, this idea about probability comes from the fact that uh, from from the from the from their mode overlap, the mo mode overlap between the pump signal and idler mode inside the wave time. So that gives you, if there is no mode overlap, of course, you will not have an efficient transfer or generation, right? So this mode overlap basically gives you the probability which would 
the probability for this process, this process, and all of that. So all these four, I treat them as individual four processes because all these four processes would have different phase matching functions, and those phase matching functions are these four. You know, the, can you see these four uh, thin lines? These are the phase matching functions or the phase matching intensity. So there are four distinct lines, but they are inclined in such a way, or they are, uh, you know, uh, because of the design, they are this way, right? And there is an overlap of all these four lines. Uh, so overlap means there is a cross, you know, there is an intersection of all the four lines. And it is in this region of intersection that we are interested in. In other regions, we will not be able to see the hyperentanglement, but in, it is in this region. So even if you don't, so if you just take, uh, let's say, if you let's say if you don't consider lambda two, if you just consider lambda one, they are actually entangled in spatial modes. Right? The signal and the idler, as you can imagine, they are entangled in spatial modes. Because when you do a coincidence detection, you don't know because they are non, like they are non-degenerate, and if you after you separate them out. Right? You don't know whether the signal or the, the mode that you're trying to establish is from this one or this one. Right? Maybe there's a lot of details. So actually, this is like several papers that I uh, tried to put in one slide. So yeah, so if you're interested, maybe you should uh, look into this for uh, better clarification. Maybe I go on to the next question. Uh, has any of these setups used to perform quantum communication just like Vipra and other did recently? Are there any plans to do it at IIT Delhi campus? Yes. Very good. Thanks for that question. Yes, we are towards it as I explained. So one of these uh, projects, the which is the DST Quest project, actually uh, explores uh, PPL and grid, right? But there actually we have only one type of grading. And uh, but by doing uh, cyanide interferometer, we would uh, like to uh, do this uh, particular, you know, entanglement of uh, this. But you know, this particular fabrication, we are we are talking to companies because it's not very easy and it's not very, you know, uh, there are certain Japanese groups whom, whose papers I have read about and we have learned a lot. We have been talking to some fabrication companies also. So by period polling is definitely possible, but cascaded polling, you know, the efficiency is not that great. Uh, I know there is a group in uh, NIS in France, um, IPMC means where uh, they use uh, such cascaded or bipolar uh, waveguide. So, uh, yeah, so I'm sure there are, uh, you know, work going on with these uh, bipolar uh, Christians. I am not sure if Ibra and Ararai uh, also did uh, work with bipolar uh, Christians or cascaded pole Christians. Maybe they have done. I'm uh, unaware of that. Uh, maybe Ararai also has certain uh, setups on, on two different types of polling in one crystal. Yeah, so I, I have to see. But we are also looking towards, like, we are also talking to companies if we can have such fabrication possible and, you know, see some of these experiments uh, really. Yeah, because we would give them the design parameters and they would lo love to do experiments and see if our ideas can convey. For example, particularly this hyperentangled by photon state, uh, we would like to see if such a thing is possible. Okay, so, other question? Okay. Are the, can I take question from somebody else? Okay, Manas Kumar. So okay. is that the last question? Because Abhishek, I already answered, I think, three, four questions. Are there quantum nodes linked via each other using optomechanical cavities? I'm sure people are working with optomechanical cavities, but as I said, all these things are quite challenging. And I, I think uh, there has been some work and uh, by using two different cavities that has been, or maybe some groups are working towards that. One has to see. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe. Okay, there was a question by Manas. Iqbal Ahmed, can you identify signal photon and idler photon separately? Uh, this question, so, you know, we usually use single photon detectors, first of all, to detect because they are signal, they are single photons, right? But uh, identify signal and idler means, for example, suppose you're playing with polarization property and you use a polarizing beam splitter, 
and it is a type 2 crystal that you're using. So, no, it is a very straightforward scenario. If it is a type 2 crystal, there are H and V that are produced. So, the H would be transmitted by a polarizing beam splitter, the V would get reflected by a polarizing beam splitter. Okay, let me go to that. Uh, yeah, this this one, for example, or let me go to a more simple picture. Yeah, let me go to the picture. You know, so V would be reflected, A would be transmitted. So in this particular thing, there is nothing, you know, you are just playing with the time correlation because in an experiment, before seeing entanglement, there are several steps that you have to see. Right. So one of those checks is such men, like whether you have good counts or not. Right. So first you would like to separate them. So in order to separate them using polarization properties, that is what you have begun with. Right? So the PDS is a scheme by which you can separate them. You know, the H would always be transmitted, the V would always be reflected, and you can have a single photon detector here and a single photon detector here, and you can look at coincidences. Right? So points and oh, so that is one thing. Then you can also separate them in uh, by using frequency filters. For example, if they are non-degenerate, one is in omega one, the other is in omega two. Then you can have certain frequency filters. Let's say if you kept a filter with omega one, you would only detect a particular kind of uh, photon. Let's say the signal photon. If you had an omega two filter, you would have you could only see the ideal photon. And so that is how. So separating them is actually not a big issue, particularly when you are discussing about photons. And uh, so now, if you're talking about uh, cold and free space, uh, that is that is a slightly different thing. And because there we your so so this uh, this kind of crystal, we they rely on quasi phase matching. There are all certain other kinds of crystals that rely on by dependent phase matching. Then we do angle tuning and all of that. Right? So uh, there are different ways of separating them and having them. And then ultimately, particularly if they are in space and if you are having uh, two cones, then you have to scan your detector to see where is that intersection or which photon you would like to see, the signal or the ideal. Right? So they anyway come out separated in space. So it is uh, in, uh, it's, uh, particularly if it is about the parasitic is matching all those two cones, right? So they come out separated. Now, I think uh, all the questions are over, Jay. Uh, oh, rest of the okay. rest of yeah. the people that are thanking you. Yeah, a lot okay. of students that are thanking you for a nice talk. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I think I took a lot of so, time. Thanks for so allowing think, me yeah, okay, extra so. time. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Yes, thanks a lot, Professor Pandit. Thanks for giving me this chance. I'm very honored. And, you know, I mean, a lot of good results have come out from your lab. You know, I asked more, some talk. more I did not show <laughs> because they were preliminary, <laughs> but yes, I'm thankful. Yeah, you're working. Thanks to the students and thank you again. Okay, to the okay see you. Thank see you. you. Bye. Yeah, okay. Bye. So, Arpiji, thanks a lot again. Huh? Thank you, Prashant.